Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Tub Takes. We are live with this video podcast that I hope at this point you've heard of. My name is Adi. I am going to be your host this week. Uh, Alex has taken a little bit of a break. He was not at Charlotte. And instead, we got three players who uh, did really well at Charlotte Regionals. And so I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Uh, Arvin, you want to go first? Uh, hey there, everyone. I'm Arvin June Cypher Tuvane. I made top four. I'm like, for the first time, very happy. Thank you for having me here. Of course. It's great to have you. Congratulations on your run. It was it was great to watch. Um, yeah, and we have, of course, we have Sohaib. How are you doing? Hi, guys. I'm Sohaib. And I finished 17th at the past weekend. Really excited to be here. Uh, the classic Sohaib result. It's got to be 17th or 33rd all every time. <laughs> <laughs> Any Damn. any number that can bubble, that's me. Uh, and then last but not least, we've got you know basically basically the second co-host on the show. We've got Nails. How you doing? Uh, it's great to be back. Uh, I got twentieth at Charlotte. Um, lost my winning in, and uh, uh, just good to be back on the show after a series of uh, pretty mediocre performances this year. Yeah, it's great to have y'all. Um, and so, yeah, let's kick things off. So first and foremost, as, as hopefully you guys know, if not, uh, you can find this on YouTube tomorrow. So make sure if you miss part of it, if you can't stick around for the entire time, make sure to check it out. Um, and yeah, let's jump into it. So first and foremost, we got some housekeeping. Um, if y'all were excited by all the action at Charlotte regionals, uh, you should, and if you want to go to a regional yourself, Vancouver regional signups are going to be starting on January 24th at 7 PM Pacific time. Uh, so a little late for East Coasters, uh, but the cap is relatively small. It's only going to be 500 uh, for for VGC. The Canadian regionals tend to be smaller than uh, American regionals, just because a lot of people have a little a tougher time getting over the border. Um, and so, uh, but 500 masters is you know sadly just short of that uh, 512 number that gets a uh, top 256 CP as well. But um, yeah, if you are trying to Go to Vancouver. Make sure to be ready. I don't know if this one's going to cap very quickly or not. Uh, it probably won't. Um, Portland only had 502 players. And um, for the reasons you mentioned about needing a passport, um, and otherwise they're about as difficult to get to, both being Pacific Northwest, um, and they're similar distance from uh, Seattle. Um, yeah, I expect uh, that regional to have like 400 or so. It could be 450, but uh, 500 is a pretty reasonable cap. I'm not going to get up in arms about a 500-player cap uh, for Vancouver like I would for, um, say, Pittsburgh. Or Orlando. Like oh, Orlando is surely going to have a bigger than 500-player cap. I yes. I was talking to... Um, Hopefully. So this is a classic Audi stop talking about what you were talking about and and go to a different point altogether but i was talking to a judge at the airport um um, on my way back uh one of the one of the judges who lives in the houston area um and he was saying that jimmy ballard who's going to be organizing uh i think it was jimmy ballard organizing the orlando regionals he's he he loves to try to smash these records and so he uh if they have enough docs um they will try to break charlotte's record and orlando was the biggest region of all time prior to this this weekend's past uh this past weekend's charlotte regionals uh, and if they, again, if they have enough docs, that's the biggest limiting factor for VGC. I would not be shocked if Orlando hit, uh, 800 and maybe even that 838 number that we hit at Charlotte. Um, and like, especially coming off of, uh, Wolf winning a regional, that's probably going to push a bit of a spike in attendance as well. Mm-hmm. So back uh, to, yeah. back, go ahead, sorry. Oh, you're good. Go ahead. Uh, back to Vancouver. Are any of you guys planning on going to Vancouver? I would want to, but it's like so close to UIC. I think I'd rather pay the money, go to UIC instead, especially as an East Coast player. Yeah, and potentially like score bigger there than than how much like CP you can get from a regional compared to a, an IC. Yeah, yeah, same here. It's much cheaper for me to fly to UIC than it is to like go to <laughs> Vancouver. Unless I do well in Knoxville, then maybe I might just do Vancouver too. But 
Um, yeah. yeah, as for me, um, I'm undecided at this point. I'm probably leaning no. It's just uh, so expensive to get to Vancouver uh, that um, it, it's like hardish to justify. I'm not going to say no because if I'm really feeling the format, then um, it, it like makes sense financially. But um, it, I have to be like really confident in myself, and um, but we'll see how it goes. Leaning now. Yeah, uh, I will say I've, I've been to Vancouver a couple times for regionals. Uh, it is one of my uh, one of my favorite. Oh, Ag Silver, thank you for the sub. Appreciate it. Um, so I will say Vancouver, one of my favorite regionals to attend. It is such a beautiful city. Uh, it, it's it's really really cool to visit. It is right the the venue is right on the waterfront, um, and it is uh it is just a, a super super cool area. Uh, <laughs> not adding to the costs of the um. The, the flight that is usually pretty expensive there, if you can't fly to Seattle and get a, 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 someone to drive you up there or take a bus, that's usually uh, a little cheaper if you live in the United States. Um, or if you can drive up to Toronto, for example, and then fly from Toronto or Montreal, that's also usually a little cheaper. I know some of, uh, I know like that's what Mike and Tommy did last year um, and they live up in upstate New York. So it made a little more sense for them. Um, but yeah, those are some ways that you can get there a little easier. I will say I, uh, uh, it is also very expensive. The, ho- the hotels around in the area are also very expensive relative to most regionals. So it is a little pricier, but if you haven't gone to Vancouver before, I would recommend. I do do love the city, um, but naturally, you know, the three of y'all are all relatively East Coast players, and so it does make sense that you're picking mm-hmm. London over it. Yeah, um, it just the the payouts from the uh, internet are so much higher that um, mm-hmm. financially justifying the decision uh, makes a lot more sense to go to London. Mm-hmm. The, the tournament's also harder. Um, like uh because of the it's tricky to get to the pacific northwest regionals tend to be uh some of the uh lower uh quality uh they're they're still difficult but um not as difficult as uh charlotte or orlando or whatever um you know vancouver was the last time that i got top eight at a regional so maybe it is maybe it is a little easier an event than than some of the others Um, (laughs) you can't say that (laughs) wow um, Nails just called Canada free. <laughs> no, I call I called Pacific Northwest free. That's very important. To <laughs> Toronto <laughs> regional from that free. Yeah, at, at Lexicon VGC, mm-hmm. he, he called you out. Oh, and yes, if he has not listened to this, uh, you're, you're on uh, farmer uh, like Mickey regional watch too. <laughs> uh, speaking of Mickey events that give out championship points, the Global Challenge uh, has, has been officially announced. And you can sign up for that starting on January 25th. Uh, do we know if you have to lock in your team when you sign up? Because I thought that was the case last time. That was the case last time. Um, I don't know if it's going to be the case this time. I don't, they certainly haven't uh, published anything on that. Uh, it's going to be standard practice with uh, Game Freak of you figure it out how it works when you open the game up and uh, mm-hmm. look at it. Uh, publishing... Uh, like do- just documenting how anything works is not really their strength, uh, or <laughs> a priority. It's they mm-hmm. they probably wouldn't be very good if they wanted to, but um, they they certainly have no interest in it. I I think we will find out on January twenty fifth when people have the opportunity to sign up. I'm sure someone will tell us. Uh, but be aware that the the tournament starts on February second. You have to sign up before it starts, or else you will not you will not get in. So just be aware of that. Uh, this is not only uh, a tournament that awards championship points for um, for us, but also it uh, is the first of three tournaments that has qualification for Japan Nationals and then also Korea Nationals, which we'll talk about in a second. But at least for us, it does award a substantial amount of championship points, um, 160 points for first, so second place at a regional, essentially, um, not counting towards that regional BFL. So uh, you can get points at every single one of these. Last year, it was only two of them. Uh, it was best, uh, you could do two best finishes would count towards your uh, world's qualification. This year, all three will count. Um, and so even though it is uh, the same time as Knoxville Originals, um, maybe it makes it a little harder for American players to compete in it. Um, but yeah, this is this is a substantial amount of championship points. And honestly, even if you don't expect to win, getting something like 30 or 20 points from that uh, top 128, top 256 range is very, very doable. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's I guess that's the main thing. 
Um, my take on this from last year um, was if you uh, if you're playing Knoxville and the Global Challenge, you can knock out some games on Friday, perhaps. Um, but just spend Saturday focusing on the regional. And if you uh, are if you are playing well and do well on Saturday and into Sunday, then just don't worry about the Global Challenge. And that's what I did at Portland last year. And um, mm-hmm. I got top four at the regional and just did not worry about it. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> if I remember correctly, like Thursday night, you can start playing the games, right? Mm-hmm. You can. It's like the that's night before. Correct. Yeah, so you could do Thursday night, and then Friday night you can play games. So it's like if you're running like a hyper-offensive team, you can almost knock out like 30 games and not worry about it Saturday night or even Sunday. Yeah, it's definitely um, oh. doable. <laughs> Uh, yeah, while we're on the topic, uh, I guess we should go over Global Challenge strategy. Um, just the same advice I've given before on this podcast, but um, you, you get uh, 15 games, you get access to 15 games per day um, in, um, over the, se- it's like a 72-hour tournament, um, and just every 24 hours you get access to 15 more of them. Uh, the best way to u- utilize them um, is to play uh you, get, you want to play at the very start because everybody's at 1,500 and you can get some players who are uh, going to finish negative and are just generally pretty easy games at the start um, and you can farm them. You want to get up to about 1,600 or so um, and then if you're playing optimally, uh, you want to just uh, hard cut off playing at about 1,600 or so and uh, not play until Sunday because at that point, um, uh, like as the tournament progresses, uh, ratings begin to spread out, um, and you get access to playing players that are like in the 1800s, um, and, uh, just a player who's at, uh, say 1650, uh, after 15 games of Pokemon probably had to go 15 and 0, they're going to be a really hard out. Uh, if you're playing somebody who's at 1650 on Sunday, they're going to be much easier than they would have been on Friday. Uh, so it just makes more sense to play all of your games uh, as late as possible after the initial period of um, just uh, like relatively soft competition. Mm-hmm. I, I have the same advice. I give everyone the same advice. If, you, if you're really playing optimally, you should play games later. Obviously, you have to be... Uh, you have to be a, a certain type of person to be able to play 45 games in a day. That is, I know I know Nails tried it uh, last year on stream, and you seemed pretty miserable at the end of it. <laughs> so. um, I have definitely done it successfully before. It was just, it was more uh, team choice. Uh, it was not uh, perfect for that one, but uh, um, it was still fun. Um, I certainly would not be able to play 45 games in a day, but I do like trying to play my last... 20 games uh, in, in, on the last day, at least. Um, more than 15, at the very least. Uh, the other thing that I have, I know this Nails is going to disagree with me. Um, Nails is also better than me at Pokemon. But my advice is uh, stop when you, are, uh, when you are comfortable with your rating. Stop when you are on a hot streak. Uh, I know so many people who say, yeah, I should have stopped at, you know, 1740 at my peak instead of, um, and, and I played, you know, five more games and I lost all five of them and I tanked all the way to 1650. And I and I lost fifty championship points as a result. And like, yeah, but like, uh, at least at least for me, it's like I'm I'm pretty aware of my skill level, and I'm pretty aware of what how I've done in the past few global challenges that I've competed in. And um, knowing that I am on a win streak and um, that I am probably above my average rating is a good reason to stop. I also think of it as uh, if I have three games left, um, I am more likely to go. I, if I want to increase my rating, I have to have at least one more win than I have losses. Unless you're at the very, very top of the ladder, at that point you could lose a lot of points for losing. But and so if I have three games left, I'm, the odds of me going two one and one two are pretty similar. Um, I can, but I can also go one zero and then I can stop, or I can go two one and stop. If I have fifteen games left, then I have to go plus one at any point in the next fifteen games, which is much more likely to happen. So uh, there's a balance between stopping when you're on a hot streak and also stopping uh, with you stop. You do, I don't want to stop with fifteen games left. You you might want to stop with five games left. Is basically that point. Um, yeah. Um, and one thing. Oh. oh, no, I was going to say, um, 
yeah so the evaluation of whether you keep playing is based on your like estimation of your skill level relative to your rank um i think i'm good enough at the game that when i'm on um i am just always like positive ev uh if i keep plugging more games um because i have a lot of confidence in my skill level um and yeah if you're not at that point which like i think there's like a couple dozen players who probably should consider themselves in that camp then yeah you are supposed to stop uh after your win streak like that is optimal um and like if you feel that you are at a rating that you're uh comfortable uh just take your points and run uh absolutely um Mm -hmm. yeah that's just good advice for everyone listening to this podcast except for those of you who know you who you are speaking of people who know who they are so high yeah (laughs) Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to say it was like, th- this is my bad habit. Then I try to avoid it as mo- much as I can. Is like, if you get, ha- like, you know, you're playing 45 games, you're about, you're going to get hacked in some of them. If you get hacked, just don't try to, like, play another one to make it up for it. Just just put it down and take a breather or take a walk. Because I've seen a lot of players that get hacked about with one game and then. They just go on this bad losing streak and their whole rating just like tanks. And those, I am one of those players too. So I've done that a couple of times. So yeah, if you lose one game, just, you know, put the game down, take a walk for 20 minutes, do other stuff, then come back later. But yeah, don't try to like chase that, you know, win after that. It's just, yeah. That's a classic gambler's fallacy of um, trying to chase your losses. It's just about trying to uh, like keep, uh, your head in the game, like keep just laser focused on uh, playing well and uh, whatever is in the past is in the past. Um, just make sure that you're making the best plays you can. Excuse me. Yep. Um, and um, just staying, uh, uh, staying in the moment and uh, making sure that uh, you're locked in on what's happening in front of you. Marvin, mm-hmm. you, uh, any any advice for global challenges? Have you played? Have you grinded these out? Sure. I've grinded it out. It's just, just think of it as just like showdown ladder or whatever. Just be relaxed, just chill, and I I just like to play go fast teams, just YOLO and just which one? I I know some people are going points for. I think for players like for myself, I just want to kind of want to get this over. It's just go fast. Get like just so, like with so I've just said, if you get hacks, there is another game where you can go walk around, take a break. You can go get then chug another game, then go take a break for a bit. Like it just for it just feels for us go fast teams. You can just get the get the worry and stress off the global challenges done at ASAP. That that's just how I operated and. Also, going on what Nails said about just playing your games at the end, it really does does help. I like some spiked my rating from like low sixteen hundreds to mid seventeen hundreds just by playing on the last day. It, it gives way more of a benefit than I ought to, but yeah, just um, like I said, if you're playing a sixteen fifty player. After 15 games, they had to go undefeated to get there. If you're playing a 1650 player, uh, after uh, 44 games, they're probably like 29 and 14 or something. Or that's 43. Mm-hmm. I can't math. And one more, one most important tip before is that don't play during when Japan is playing. You're going to mess up your rating really, really badly. <laughs> I, I disagree okay. with that. I have uh, my best performances have been off of farming Japan. Um, but, uh, it's an experience. You have to know what you're opting into. Uh, Japan has, uh, they generally, uh, in the past, it's been true that they've run, uh, more wild stuff. And it's probably more true now that, uh, Western metagames are open team sheet, uh, or at least the, uh, and, uh, so you, you really have to be ready, uh, for anything, um, like have showdown open um the, the team builder and, and just look up uh funny moves that they could be running um if you don't have all that stuff memorized which honestly you really don't need to as much anymore um now uh it was in in the past it was really important to just like have a pretty encyclopedic 
yeah, knowledge of uh, like every Pokemon's move pool. And now you really just, it's not necessary. Uh, for global challenges, it very much is. Um, and so if you, like, understandably, if you're a new, newer player and you understandably don't have that knowledge, um, uh, don't be afraid to just look everything up and make sure you're not getting pranked by something. Um, like, you, you still probably know it, most moves that Amon gets, but um, just giving it a quick skim. Uh, sword by base power uh, is a great tool for this. Uh, you just sort uh, uh, by base power and see like any high power moves that they could have access to, and then you scroll right down to the status moves and just look for anything funny that might be there. Um, it can get you uh, around getting ally switched or something like that. Uh, or fissured. Right, yeah, right down. I mean, who had the who had the list of ally switch mods pinned to there? <laughs> uh, so actually, I want to get to a couple questions in chat that we had. Uh, first one is, uh, does anyone have any kind of advice on what type of teams to use? I know Arbin, you said you wanted to use hyper offensive teams, kind of get it over with. Uh, but so hive, Nick, did you have um, any thoughts on that? Yeah. So one of the GCs, I I don't know. I think I finished the top sixteen in it. Um, I think with globe, pretty sure it was globally because I, I got a crap ton of CP from there. But uh, yeah, I use like Palafin. But what I did was like I just moved the items around and sets around. So it was like a standard Palafin team. But for example, it had like Iron um, Iron Hands had like SD with goggles, and Arcanine had some other item. And so that's what I did. And for the GC, it was. It's just, I use this pretty standard team, good mods, just different sets. So it's like, for example, I didn't have goggles on the Arcanine, so nobody ever yeah, sported it, but the berry just helped me win a lot of games, and and I hit a lot of fissures with my Ting Lu, so that was very helpful too in that run. So <laughs> always in a fishy spot, just go for fissures. <laughs> um, I can say the most successful global challenge I've had... Um... In terms of championship points, I got first place um, in the first 2018 Global Challenge um, using dual screens Tapu Koko, which was not a set that really anybody was running at that point. Um, and it just subverted expectation um, from a lot of people. Like uh, Coco was just clicking Gigavolt Havoc or uh, Choice Specs uh, moves a lot of the time. And so players would often protect on a turn one and I would be able to get a screen off and then I'd taunt Namungus or something and just get a lot of time to execute my strategy um, that players uh, wouldn't have given me otherwise. Um, there is not like a set in stone strategy that you have to use. Um, if you if time is a factor, which it's a lot of games of Pokemon, then running something aggressive like Arbin said is just a good way to uh, get your games done. Um, it, I would, um, but generally, I just lean into how you like to play the game um, more than anything. Uh, I think that doing Scream Tail stuff is probably fine for me. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it unless you're into that, but um, I'm honestly, I'm just not sure what I'm going to run for it yet. I'm probably going to do some prep for it. Uh, uh, and realistically, I'm probably just going to end up using whatever I run at Knoxville um, in the Global Challenge, because, mm -hmm. um, like, prep for one, or, like, just running 45 games is going to make you better at playing the team. And so uh, uh, I'll probably uh, use Knoxville, uh, or use the Global Challenge as a bit of Knoxville prep to make sure that my team is working right. I was uh, talking just, to. It's really last minute, but it gives you the chance to say, "Oh, this isn't working. I'm going to pivot onto what my friend's running." I was talking to Kyle at the airport, uh, Animus Kyle Livinghouse, and he was saying he basically exclusively practices on uh, on Battle Stadium, and he just thinks it's the same. Like, it's it's just as effective practice as the best of the ladder. I don't entirely agree with that, but I do agree with what Nail said in that um, I'm going to Knoxville. I will be playing my games Thursday and Friday, uh, and then maybe uh, if I make day two, maybe Saturday night. If I don't make day two, probably on Sunday. Um, I'll be finishing my games uh, as much as possible. I probably will end up with like 30 games played. But uh, but yeah, like I think that if you're going to Knoxville, use the same team. It's just not worth trying to build two different teams, get good at two different teams. Um, to give other people advice, you know, someone asked about uh, dealing with closed Terra types. Um, 
just play on play practice. That's really all there is to it. Practice on Battle Stadium. You're gonna get better. It's I, I don't know. If, like generally, I'd say like you need to play more conservatively in closed team sheet in general. Um, but if you've been playing in closed team sheet formats before, which is of course any time before 2023, you're generally pretty aware of how you need to play differently in closed team sheets, which is that you need to play a little more conservatively, play around all the options that are available as much as possible. Or if you can't play around certain options, just I, in my opinion, you just disregard them. You say, if I can't beat this Pokemon being this set in this situation, it's just not going to be that. And I'm going to beat everything else. Um, so that's, that's my take on that. Yep. Um, um, we are in a pretty offensive format. that. Um, I think, um, I think some of that is, uh, due to OTS, um, pushing aggression a little harder, but, um, yeah, you generally want to play a bit more respectfully in closed sheets. Um, just, uh, the format is pretty offensive. Um, and so uh, there's just a balance to be struck. Um, uh, now that I'm saying that, I wonder if like Incineroar is better or if it's, uh, Incineroar gets worse in open sheets because you, uh, uh like, I'm not sure exactly what the correlation there I is, think, so it's probably... I think Covert Cloak gets a lot better, which and Terra Ghost gets a lot better, yeah. which makes me a lot more scared of using Incineroar, personally. That's a really good point. Um, uh, and the fact that Incineroar has already been mm -hmm. underwhelming, despite the fact that you can play around Terra Ghosts and Covert Cloaks, um, yeah, maybe Incineroar is... I, I mean, it's still a very good Pokemon um, uh, with a great kit just uh gen 9 has given us a lot of counterplay to its uh, best tools in, in the well, you guys are not thinking far enough right like you just draw fake out true <laughs> honestly you, honestly you, though <laughs> you just you well, parting you, shot every time yeah, yeah. <laughs> knock out flare blitz uh parting shot protect uh mm -hmm. it's just a yep good, uh global challenge in center mm -hmm. true heard it here first and so mm -hmm. i remember i remember the first time <laughs> I played a, a in, in a GS Cup format in Philly 2018. Nails gave me a team, and he said, uh, "Don't ever click fake out with Incineroar. Just click U-turn. Uh, every time you want to click mm -hmm. fake out, click U-turn." And then uh, that that was that was some of the best Incineroar advice I've ever gotten. So yeah, just don't click fake out. Just don't even run it. Shout out to uh, <laughs> a million folks for that one. Um, uh, I, I here I'll give my Incineroar advice. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, so the way it works, um, Incineroar has got three states that it can uh, exist in. It can be in the back, uh, ready to switch and intimidate something. It can be on the board with Fake Out Live, and it can be on the board without Fake Out Live. Um, the relative strengths of those, um, Incineroar with Fake Out Live has a ton of pressure. It can turn off uh, almost any opposing Pokemon for the turn. Uh, you have to just uh, respect it. Uh, and it forces a bunch of attacks and like it's just got a ton of pressure um then incineroar in the back uh when it's ready to switch in and intimidate and then you will have to deal with its fake out pressure that's uh second and then at a distant third is incineroar just sitting there doesn't have fake out live um and it's like very punishable in that state and so the way to play incineroar is you want to avoid being in the third state like as much as you can in the way you, uh, and so what follows is you just always uh, use the pivot move on the fake out turn. Um, just get it, get him out of there. Uh, you still get to capitalize some on the fake out pressure, but you don't get to, um, you don't get punished for it. And it just gives you the best of like all of the worlds. You still got your switch and intimidate. You still got to force passivity on that turn and do whatever you wanted with your other slot while well, they had to respect your cat. And you're just not. Uh, uh, giving up pressure uh, the following turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can look. really tell a person's skill level by how well they use the Incineroar on their team. And that's why Sohab didn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> so <Hey. laughs> I was the one that was the most happy about it, and I just couldn't fit it in my team. Like Paul gave me a lot of shit for that. I was, he was just like, "How could you do that? You're not running Incineroar." I was like. Can't. <laughs> <laughs> so that's we we've talked about the global challenge a lot. We'll probably talk about it more next week. I know Alex has been grinding the global challenge, and he'll be on again next week. I hope. Uh, and so, yeah, or, or honestly, he's gonna be streaming tomorrow with uh with some more best of one ladder. So uh, he's also a good person to ask questions to. Um, but yeah, we are going to move on because we do have to recap Charlotte at some point. 
Um, but I guess one last piece of global challenge news is that this is also the qualifiers for the uh, the Korean circuit as well. If you remember, the we, we talked to Nash last year about the uh, the Korean circuit. He was one of the players who got banned um, from the Korean circuit uh, after protesting the way that they had basically changed the circuit so that there was no... Um, there was no uh, regionals, no IRL component to it at all, other than a somewhat meaningless like four-player tournament. And so the four player, the five, the five players who actually ended up getting invited to the tournament all got banned for protesting. Um, and so, yeah, if you are in Korea, you do have to finish top 50 to play, and then you play another online tournament later on, just like in Japan. And at that point, the top 32 will get an invite to an IRL event. And Nash has also said that uh, he is not uh, that, that he and presumably the other Korean players are not um, are not going to be unbanned at least this year. So it, it sounds like uh, uh, that T, 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 TPK, is that it? Uh, or T, just TP, TPC um, is going to, is not really listening to, to what we've been saying, um, to certainly what the Korean players have been saying. It's very disappointing to hear this because uh, Nash has been a fantastic part of not just the Korean community, but the global community as a whole. And, uh, and it's, I mean, really just been a fantastic representative of the Korean VGC scene, both as the, you know, Kore- Korean manager, as well as, uh, as well as you know, he's come on our podcast before. He's he's talked to a bunch of other people about this. So, yeah, this is this is very disappointing. But um, but yeah, he's a great guy, and um, hopefully he sticks around in the community despite not being able to participate officially. But uh, it's just a shame to see the see what's happened to him. Hopefully, uh, eventually they come around on him because he's yeah, just a great community member. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then, uh, of course, we did mention that the Japanese National Championships are also going to be, uh, this is that the Global Challenges is part of the qualifiers for Japanese Nationals, so we did actually get confirmation of the dates for Japan Nationals. Uh, notably, if, you, if you've seen Japan Nationals in the past, this is very often a huge metagame changer. Uh, pe- if you are playing in the West, you should be paying attention to what does well here, because a lot of times what does well here shakes up the metagame tremendously. Um, and, and this is of course, right before the North American championships, I think right before Los Angeles regionals too. Uh, and so I'm actually not sure I, I might get the dates wrong for that, but so it's one week it's after. Right after. <laughs> okay. So one week before, uh, then NAIC. So pay attention to what does well here, because I think people will bring what does well here to, uh, to the North American championships. I would not be surprised at all, even though the format is it quite is. different. Yeah, no, it is. It's uh, just people ripping well, uh, strong teams from Japan. That's is a tradition uh, at NAIC and uh, just happens every year. And um, team, like the success level varies, but you're always going to see some stuff in day two that uh, uh, did well at Japan. That's usually it's not uh, completely optimal to rip uh, Japan's best of one teams uh, and try to make them work in open sheets best of three but uh usually they perform pretty okay um is what i will say about it um uh players who are trying to win the event um generally uh haven't performed too well but um like the you can you can make a pretty deep run with uh japan Nets teams and uh i mean sometimes it's just the sauce for the format and so you have to keep it in mind. Didn't, uh, didn't Alex say he got like the inspiration from his team from Japan Nationals last year? I think he's gotten it from my team that I ran. Big <laughs> matter, but, uh, no, just, just jokes aside. Um, yeah, uh, I don't remember if he said that or not, but I wouldn't be terribly surprised. And if that's true, then throw out everything I just said. We're just a hard rip from Japan. Uh, they know <laughs> what they're doing better than we do. And I mean, uh, the the other trick is steal whatever here Fumi used because chances are he just he knows what's supposed to be what people are supposed to be doing even months in advance. Okay, like a real a real talk. That's actually <laughs> pretty good advice. Here Fumi's pretty crack. That or Snow, those yeah. teams. Yeah, no, there, there's there's a lot of uh, really strong Japan players, and um, they uh, they pull out all the stops for Japan. That's that is their um, most important tournament of the season, uh, and. Uh, and t- like there is only one shot uh you're not allowed to miss and so you just take your best shot at japan nets and so everybody uh pulls no punches uh and they put in a ton of effort trying to crack the metagame 
Um, so, like, taking inspiration, even if you don't uh, rip the direct six, uh, is still uh, really cool. Um, in 2018, I remember there was a really cool Nitto Clean team, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and Nitto Clean had done barely anything all season. And then uh, it just came out of nowhere at Japan Nets, and it was like, oh, now Nitto Clean's in the meta. Deal with that, you guys. Um, and that's just like the type of example of something that, um, like, like it, it's got the, there are going to be surprise picks at Japan Nats and, uh, he, you're meant to be paying attention to it. That, in fact, that was here Fumi team that he won here for Japan Nats with Neo Queen. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I remember, I think, yeah. I know Fiona made day two of NAIC that year with it, uh, ripping it basically bar for bar. I think there was at least one other. I know Nito Queen had a, a decent performance that year. But yeah, and then here Fumi, of course, also his Worlds team won two regionals this year. Later in, like, <laughs> later on, right? Even in the next format, it won two regionals. So uh, yeah, like I said, rip her of Fumi's team. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you're still allowed to roll up with your own stuff if you uh, have the sauce for US Nats, but um, that's a ways off. But yeah. Mm -hmm. um, dang it. J Japan. Um, they're yeah they've got good stuff it's not a, it's not all, all it's not always good stuff and there's always some gas that we uh laugh about and uh um it, it like it's just hilarious uh team comps um and we can clearly see what they're going for um but um the fact that it's best of one close sheets uh for a swiss bracket just means you can um, you can make it through with uh, really funny stuff, um, and so it, it it's uh, it's my version of Christmas is opening up the Japan Nats teams and seeing what they cooked. Um, Honestly, same here. I love looking up what they're cooking, you know, in Japan. Um, was, Japan Nats, yeah. There was someone that used like acrobatics talent flame in the last Japan Nats, correct? And I like yeah, no item. Well. Mm -hmm. I I know Talonflame yep. won Japan Nats. I don't know if that was the same team. There there was an acrobatic sound flame that uh, did well last year. There, were, um, choice band Talonflame is another uh, classic Japan Nats uh, mon. Uh, I remember the three move Talonflame with uh, Brave Bird, Flare Blitz, and Sleep Talk. Um, you just don't have uh, room for you don't have need for a fourth move. It would make the set worse. <laughs> Um, and uh, like I've used Choice Sleep Talk uh, multiple times this uh, this gen, just inspired from that type of stuff. Like, yeah, it's you, you can absolutely get some uh, useful tidbits from Japan. That's um, oh yeah, it was item most talent one that won this last year. Thanks, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mr. Tashima. Here's the yeah, here's the team that won. I can't read Japanese, but <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so. On that note, let's talk about Charlotte Regionals because uh, we're, we'll talk plenty more about Japan Nationals when Japan Nationals actually happens. So just like we'll yeah. talk more about the GC when that starts happening. But we do have uh, Charlotte Regionals that we... Whoops, that's not the right page. Get that out of here. Here we go. Uh, we got Charlotte Regionals and we got, of course, the top four finisher, Arben, right here. Um, and uh, yeah, but I guess first we should talk about the, the winner. I guess we should talk about Wolf... Uh, who did end up winning this regional uh, with this team, um, which, uh, I don't know. I don't know. What, uh, Nails, I guess I'll let you comment on it because you were the uh, the combined flutter guy. Um, what, and I know this is very, very different from what, what you've run in the past, but what do you think of this team? Sure. So um, the, the take that I heard somewhere, I have not verified it, um, but I just heard a friend say that uh, Wolf, did not uh he fought against one for a Gareth user and two indeedies over the course of 18 rounds um so he was the one guy at the tournament that was able to uh cycle fake outs and parting shots and u-turns and no one else had access to that because the rest of us were going through a field where for a Gareth was at like uh what's 47 over 256 it's like uh 18 percent usage um and wolf just was not playing that meta and so uh, he he had a leg up on the field because he called that his bracket wouldn't have Fergraf and Ndidi in it, and um, 
he, he played Nicholas Donnelly three times in the like uh apparently he three owed him, so presumably the matchup was pretty good. Um and otherwise just got to run those uh those mons. Um Yeah, he uh, faced in a DD round uh, one, I'll let you know. And also in day two as well. But he did he uh, just faced. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I said he faced two, but yes. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, Call Mine Flutter, uh, I haven't seen uh, any of his sets uh, just because I had a fun travel schedule getting back home. Uh, but I'm assuming it's a bulky speed booster because that's the right way to run CM Flutter. Um, he had Moonblast and Shadow Ball instead of Draining Kiss and he has Terror Grass to get around to Moongus because um, the Moongus counterplay is uh sufficient but um maybe wouldn't be like flutter does need help with among us and so of running misty terrain cloth key like i had he just has the terror grass which is solid it also avoids surging strikes like the team looks solid it looks like um it it, it's got the cryo block to support the flutter um it it just yeah it looks like a solid comp um nothing too much to uh, to say about it um uh, Scarf or Shifu is one of the best ways to remove Qian Pao. Um, uh, and just, yeah, uh, team looks cool. Um, yeah. Uh, also, notably, he has double setup, not just one, uh, with Combine and Swartins, uh, Swartins Ogre Pond. One of the takeaways that I had prior to this regional after Portland was that setup mods had really dropped in usage. I think there was almost none in, uh, in top cut. Uh, and now here we see, and I, I mean, depending on how you count Howl, um, that, is, that is another setup Mon too, right? But uh, that is kind of the only one that did well, but it's interesting that he uh, he managed to pull off setup a little more. Obviously, like you said, uh, being able to actually abuse Fake Out, it definitely helps with that. Um, but yeah, that was another uh, interesting component that, you know, maybe we see, maybe, maybe we see some people take inspiration from this and try to find ways to enable setup a little more. Uh, I certainly, I'm a big fan of the Swartz Dance Ogre Pond set, uh, and so I definitely want to to see if that can, um, if I can find a little more leverage for that. Although I am noticing that, it, of course, it is Grassy Glide, not Horn Leech, uh, <laughs> and that means that he is even more susceptible to that uh, those priority blocking potentially. Not exactly. Uh, it has Mold Breaker, so it can uh, Grassy right. Glide through um, for Gareth. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah, for um, that. and that's a really cool uh, touch. Uh, from his team that apparently uh, uh, apparently didn't come up because uh, he didn't <laughs> play many for a but um, cool attack nonetheless. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm told in chat that it's 77 mm-hmm. speed in Cinderwar and the team is posted on his Patreon. Uh, so, yeah, I guess um, uh, Arbin and Sohaib, did y'all have any thoughts on Wolf's team before we move on? I just find it interesting. He went for the Hyper Voice Throat Spray set instead of the typical Dabbing Gleam that, and Citrus that usually goes on Defensive Furgraph. I heard that... I, I didn't get to watch any of Wolf's games, unfortunately, but I heard that like the Furgraph, the Furgraph was just doing massive damage all around, which I thought is like, a really cool take on the Furgraph. That's so. just another setup threat, honestly. Um, like, uh, for Gref that has protect and also has, uh, two fake outs that you can pivot in, uh, just gives, um, uh, like armor tell fake out, um, is just, uh, it gives you so much freedom to do whatever, uh, you want to do because you get to turn off one opposing mon and the other guy can't fake you out back. Um, mm-hmm. and so yeah, for Gref is just a setup right in its own right with the throat spray and it can probably... I'm assuming it can go crazy because uh, uh, I mean he went 17 and one in games, so you'd have to assume that almost everything, if not everything, is just working. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, but for I figure off having your trick room setter and the offensive threat is just like really good, right? Because if you have blood moon, like you have to like position it in in trick room and then get damage off. But this way, you can just like set it up and just start firing off strong attacks, so I think it's just or a really cool, very well built team. Uh, I'm just curious like how he went about like beating like Tornadoes teams. Like half his team is weak to flying types. So 
And oh. uh, if you look at his, his one loss uh, in, sorry, let's go back here. If you look at his one loss, it was to Steven Mia, who was on a Tornadoes team. And, in, oh. um, and you know, that this was a team, we'll, we'll get to, we'll get to Steven's team uh, soon enough, but that is the, uh, the sort of Torn Glim team that was picking up in popularity before the tournament. Uh, he managed to beat uh, one in, in day one. So it's not like this is the only Torn team he faced, but uh, yeah, no, I agree. I think that this is the, looking at this team. This is the type of team that I would have loved to face since I was also on Torn Glim. Um, but I could see how a lot of other teams, like, right, like when you don't have a fake out for, or you don't have any priority moves, Vergraph becomes a lot less scary. Uh, when you don't have a Blood Moon, you are a lot less scared of going into Trick Room. Um, when you got things like Double Spiky Shield, you're not as scared of uh, as, as a fake out, right? Um, but I don't know. I think that I, overall, like, I think that the number one, the number one is that I think if you're going to use Incineroar, you have to use Urshifu. I think that's the only like, like I think that. If you're not, there, there's so many Pokemon that have Protect in this format that if you are not trying to, um, if you're not using your Fake Out to break through Protect, it is it is really really hard to, it is really hard to abuse it. Um, and then I also think that the setup setup mods are the other way to abuse it. And so I think he built his team to to abuse Fake Out as much as possible, um, while still doing, I guess, well enough into opposing Photograph, but. Uh, to 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 at least have play into it, right? Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's any other like super interesting choices. Again, the the ogre pond and the flutterbane sets mm -hmm. are are pretty unique. And I know he, in in top in his, in was it finals or was it top four? He, he terror ghosted the incineroar very aggressively just to get a parting shot off, just to like dodge taking sixty from a net minus one ivy cudgel. And so that was really interesting. The way he played incineroar was very different, using it almost like using it as a very aggressive terror Pokemon. Um, that was really cool to see as well. So maybe that is something else that we should take away from from uh, from the team is not necessarily the the mods themselves, but how we used some of the Pokemon that like Incineroar maybe is a little under uh, underused right now. My thinking on doing when I was watching that turn was like I've like I've watched a lot of Wolfie's games. A lot of the times he plays like pretty safe. So my thinking was like when he tired Ghost, I was like he didn't want to risk the crit KO on the Incineroar because. I felt like Incineroar was the only real, real thing that was just like slowing the pace down of Lucas' team with just consistent intimidates and parting shots. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I was feeling. That's why he tired that to keep the momentum up. Yeah, I, I haven't gotten to watch a ton of his games. I literally only watched top four, but I am curious if he managed to, if he was doing this more often or if he was not. But I looking at this team, it looks like it's a lot of defensive Terras, with the exception of the uh, the Ogre Pond, of course, which cannot defensively Terra and the Urshifu, which probably does need to be Terra, uh, probably should be Terra Water most of the time. Um, but other than that, it's all defensive Terras, right? And so uh, that is a, that is an interesting takeaway as well. Uh, and, and Sinor especially, I think, is allowed to defensively Terra if that's the way that you want to play. Uh, but yeah, speaking of um, speaking of that, I know people mentioned he did he did beat uh, Nick, who had Tornadus as well, and he beat him three times in the tournament. Not me. Yes. Different neck. Yeah. I just need to get that up. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Not not you. Uh, <laughs> the, the I, I was also at 7 at this tournament. Like, <laughs> I, I was. Uh, uh, and so the, there was. Yeah. I just need to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah sorry. Any, uh, different, yeah. Diff different Nick. Um, uh, did beat. He, bid, he did meet Nic Nicholas Dilnelli and not Nicholas Navarre. Uh, three times this tournament, Nick would never lose to to Wolf. I know that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, and and notably, uh, not also not uh, also not this Nick, but uh, also Nicholas and Ellie went thirteen and zero in uh, undefeated in in sets against people who weren't Wolf, uh, and, and had a really really impressive run uh, with this team, which is also really really cool to see because it is using some stuff that we haven't seen as much of. Uh, notably, it is. Um, a, uh, a faster Ursaluna Blood Moon team. Uh, you know, I think we've mostly seen Ursaluna on on more closer to hard Trick Room teams, but this one, in fact, looks like it actually wants to go very fast with Imprisoned Trick Room on Ferrigarath, with Tailwind on Tornadus, of course, um, and then also with the uh, the Clear Amulet Iron Hands. Iron Hands a Pokemon that uh, has dropped off and uses tremendously this format, but uh, did do very very well uh, again. And so that is also very very cool to see. And then uh, the other notable takeaway for me is that Ogre Pond. Ogre Pond Fire, you know, Ogre Pond Water was 40-something percent usage. It was number two usage overall, both in day one and day two. 
but there were three Ogre Pond Fire in top eight, including both in finals. Um, and that was not even in the top 12 in usage for day one or day two. So it really popped off um, in, in day two at the very least, uh, managing to get three of top eight. Um, so that is another, this was set obviously different, not using Sword Stance, using a, um, the more traditional follow me spiky shield, although using Wood Hammer instead of a Horn Leech like you normally see, um, or Power Up like you might see. Um, so those are my, my big takeaways from the team. I don't have any like overarching thoughts about how it plays other than it's a really different take on for Rigorath Blood Moon than what we've seen recently. Um, yeah, any any thoughts on this? I think Arvin, you play you played Nick in top yeah. four, right? I I did play him in top four. It it's, I think it's just standard. Uh, just be aggressive. He has Torn Urshifu, and then he has the Turbo Blood Moon. He just gets that Tailwind off, just starts doing damage, and then has the Phragraph option. If he ever runs out of Tailwind, and he has like Ursaluna out, and his opponent still has like Pokemon that are faster than Blood Moon not in Tailwind, such as, like, Champ Out, he can just get the Furgraph in, protect his Blood Moon, Brick Room, and just, whatchamacallit, just flip the speed. He has, he has the speed ceiling and the speed floor. It's, like, kind of reminds me of what Wolf did at, like, uh, Fort Wayne Regionals last year. It just seems very, very solid. Very, he can just get damage off ASAP. Yeah, um... I played him in, I think, round 7 or 8. I, I think it was one of those rounds. I played him in round 8, so uh, you played him in round 7. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I played him in round 7. So, same, like Arvin said, it's a... Uh, you have to respect both the modes. Like, if you call one more wrong, like, for example, game 1, I was leaning hard into him leading Trick Room mode, but he went to Torn Blood Moon mode. And just that speed just, like, overwhelmed my team really, really quickly. So, definitely, you have to, like, respect both the modes equally and you, you cannot mess up against it it's just too much offense coming at you mm -hmm. uh, yeah so uh i just want to point out uh, a couple of things he's got the photograph plus uh, a fake out user um that wolf also had and uh we've seen a number of players uh bring uh iron hands photograph is just uh it's a pretty forced trick room you'd uh, it's tough to contest, um, the, and you, there's only a few like really specific ways that you can get through it, and so you just have to deal with the trick room um, if he wants to go for it, um, and he also just does not have to go for it. Um, uh, he went for it one of the two games against me, uh, and, uh, and it's just uh, a lot of team preview pressure that you just have to get uh, the call right, or you're probably going to be caught out of position against it. Um, close combat Iron Hands is a really interesting uh, move. We, and especially Clear Amulet. Um, I think this was uh, something that uh, was um, made prominent by, or like. Uh, brought to everyone's like collective consciousness by Hoij, uh, HS, uh, who posted a team with it, um, like the Clear Amulet Hands, Frigoraf, uh, Blood Moon. Um, uh, I think most of this comp is uh, uh, either inspired or taken from Hoij's team. Um, and someone else, uh, if they're more certain about that. Can, uh, yeah, they had speed boost flutter over the torn, and pretty much everything else is the same. Okay, yeah, um, but yeah, it's just a really solid comp, um, and uh, it provides a ton of pressure. Like Incineroar can't fake out uh, uh, in front of Frigoraph, and it just drops to close combat. It's uh, a lot of pressure, unless you're Terra Ghost like uh, Wolf, which probably, uh, if it doesn't flip the matchup, it at least pro provides like a lot more for Iron Hands to think about. But it's... Um, yeah, it, it's just a solid comp, and I, I mean, I got 2 would by it, so... Uh, I, I had my shot at it, and uh, everyone except for uh, Wolf got taken out by it, so... Uh, mm -hmm. If you were... It, you, you knew about it coming in, if you were paying... Uh, like any attention at all. It was pretty widespread on the BO3 letter and uh, was posted publicly. So it wasn't it, it wasn't under the radar exactly, but it um, 
if you if you were living under a rock even now you know about it uh gin fury thank you for the raid uh appreciate it i hope you had a good stream um we are recapping charlotte regionals right now so we are talking about the uh the second place team where uh where nick sadly not the nick that is on the show but uh nicholas Danelli um went 13 and 0 against players who were not named uh named wolf click uh 15 and 0 in fact because he, he also won two in top cut right so 15 and 0 including beating all three of my uh my my lovely guests on the podcast in route two getting second place at the regional um and uh yeah so uh i guess but yeah like like, like you said i think that this this style of team um i think a lot of people had sort of on their radar uh going into the tournament um i think most people felt like Farigaraf blood moon was one of the top three threats to deal with. I know I certainly had it pretty high up on my on my list of things to prepare for, but it's very imp- I think the the changes that they made were uh, were worked in their favor a lot. Um, again, I think most of these teams that had the Dark Shifu, uh, Farigaraf, Ursa Luna core had something like a Speed Booster Fluttermane and not a Iron Hands, right? And so I think that uh, some of the some of these changes um, really worked in their favor and allowed them to. Uh, I guess I guess pilot through a field that was I thought was going to be a little more antagonistic towards Burger Apple Bloodman mean, really effectively. Yeah, yeah, they had the sorry, uh, they had they they had the Flutterman over the Torn. They still had the Iron Hands in, in the original version. Okay. But what made this team really really scary was the Blood Moon being super fast. I feel like because in the original comp it was so slow, so it's like that still gave you like a little bit of a breathing room. Where it's like if you call the wrong mode, you're not gonna you're not going to get like overwhelmed by it. But that uh, almost like that super like turbo of Blood Moon was just like very very scary. Like, Urban, the margin of error was type of comp. Uh, you haven't weighed in at all. <laughs> yeah. Despite uh, yeah. being uh, another solid performer on this comp. Wait, wait, repeat that, repeat that. Oh, just, uh, you haven't really said anything at all, despite the fact that you ran a reasonably similar it's, comp. It's just a very, very strong team. It's As I said before, you had speed ceiling, you had speed floor. Oh, yeah. It was, and like you said, it's team preview pressure. Which mode are they going to go? It's just an absolutely solid team, or archetype. Mm-hmm. So yeah, definitely look look forward to seeing a lot more of this team as well. Just like looking forward to seeing a lot more of Wolf's team uh, in the upcoming couple of weeks, maybe in the GC or at Knoxville Regionals. Uh, and then moving on, we got top four. Uh, we got an archetype that I think was also rising in popularity, but I don't think anyone really took that seriously. Uh, was was gouging fire? I think everyone's seen this this sort of uh, speed booster howl, heat crash, breaking swipe, gouging fire on ladder uh, recently usually paired with a King Gambit, uh, and um, I at least did not really respect it, uh, but Luca is is the King Gambit guy. He is maybe the best King Gambit user uh, in the last the last year or so, and um, he got all the way to top four with it. Um, thoughts on Gadget Fire? I think he's a cool guy. He's a cool-looking Pokemon. I, I kind of like how boosting the King Gambit, just making it stronger. And then Heat Crash just does random dummy damage on a on a lot of random stuff. Like you could probably you can KO Ogre Ponds, the Flutter Mains, just with so ease. Just and if they bring in Cinderor, well your King Gambit's just gonna get the free plus one. So I think it's it's a team I would want to play around with more in the future, honestly. Um, interesting to, uh, see the Stellar Terra Chan Pao. Um, it gets, uh, it's just a lot of extra reach on your crash and your sucker punch, uh, in exchange for giving up the, um, freedom that, uh, Terra Ghost provides you defensively, uh, or I guess offensively, kind of, because you just get to get around fake out. Um, and, uh, it's... I, I don't know if that was um, uh, good or bad uh, overall, but I mean, he finished top four, so I'm going to assume. I, I'm assuming that everything worked pretty well for Luca uh, over the course of the tournament, but um, yeah, it's 
uh, just a lot of abusers for Howl and then a Specs Flutter main to keep your damage profile as like close as you can get it to uh, balanced with only one Pokemon. It's just the best special attacker uh, in the format still. And um, yeah, just uh, Howl goes pretty crazy um, when you get going and you've got two Mons that can a lot of stats uh, for very little time investment. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, good job, Luca, for IDing that and then, uh, mm -hmm. like, making a good team with it and making a deep run. I, I will say, mm -hmm. uh, watching Wolf play against it made it look really bad. <laughs> Wolf, Wolf yeah. has a tendency to I do that. Say that. Um, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, as I was mentioning, <laughs> taking this, uh, the Terra Ghost off of the Qian Pao probably really felt bad in uh, the Wolf matchup. Um, I'm ass uh, I haven't watched the set, but I'm assuming that it was just a bunch of uh, fake out cycling and getting to take a bunch of time uh, and do whatever he wanted. Um, and uh, Luca does not have great tools to deal with fake out cycling um and having being able to set up a double ghost board is not um like guaranteed to get there but it is a nice tool to have access to and um yeah just uh i, I haven't seen this out so uh that's just uh, i mean you basically happened. described what happened yeah i mean <laughs> yeah uh <laughs> Uh, I I am I am looking through uh, I'm looking through his schedule, Lucas schedule, and I do notice that you know it is there is a conspicuous lack of Incineroar. Um, he did win beat, beat the one Incineroar he played in day one uh, against Sam Pletcher, uh, but then he played Wolf a couple times. Obviously, round fifteen, I think he was locked into cut anyway, so it didn't actually matter. But then losing to Wolf in cut, uh, and so if there was ever a gouging fire, I think in general has an Incineroar problem, really doesn't like getting that minus one, even though it can offset it with Howl. Burning Bulwark does not block Parting Shot, so it always gets, always have that safe, um, that Parting Shot off. And the way that Wolf played against the King Gambit, even though, yeah, you get the plus one, you can click Fake Out, Close Combat into it, and it can't stop you with the Urshifu. And it, even if it Terra Darks, like we saw in that, I think, game two of top four, it get down to 10%, and then it does, what, 60% to Incineroar, 50% to Incineroar, um, with the, the plus two Kauto cleave, and it's like, yeah, okay, that's whatever. And then the King Gambit dies, and you burn your Terra. Uh, and so I was very impressed by the way Wolf played against it. And if Incineroar comes back into the metagame uh, a little more, then I think Gouging Fire is going to have a lot harder time uh, moving forward. That's my take on it. Yeah, I mean, pretty good meta call from Luca, just saying that Incineroar was not uh, going to be in his bracket. Um, uh, it's like it was on about 25% of teams in top 256 and um, uh, he has some Incineroar counterplay but it's not a fun matchup and so yeah just uh, uh, like w have your bracket not have the bad matchup it's that easy um, like, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's dismissive and like you need some pairing luck to get uh, a deep run at one of these tournaments um so and, and someone in chat did say luca wanted to have terra dragon king gambit and did not have the time to get one uh in, in time uh should it should it hit me up i got so many dragon terra shards i did the palkia raid um but uh <laughs> uh and then also um he, he said he that the uh ogre pond was supposed to be jolly but um was, was an adamant accent although it did win him a a game he, he told me that in dms um if you are looking for a uh uh, he, he tweeted out the he tweeted out the rental code as well if you want to try it out. Um, let me let me pull that up. Uh, so and I know Alex is going to be streaming with this sometime this week, maybe tomorrow. Um, so if you are looking for some some game more gameplay, uh, Alex is going to be trying the team out. I think tomorrow um, on this channel. So make sure to make sure to follow us and make sure to click that notification bell so you don't miss anything and you know etc. But yeah, feel free to try this team out. Um, I definitely think that it's a very cool take on. Um, it's a very cool team. Gadget Fire doing well is very cool to see. I don't know if it has the staying power I'd like it to, but uh, yeah, worth trying out for sure. Um, and yeah, 
so now we got uh, this this other guy who made top four. Uh, Arbit, Arbit, tell us about your team. Oh, so it's this it's the Tornadus, Flutter Main, Urshifu Dark, and then pair it up with Furgraph Blood Moon Core. And then I just threw in a Sisuian Arcanine because he's a cool dude. And honestly, it glued the team together. I would say it's like typical, just like Nicholas, it, I wanted to have a team that can abuse Fluttermane, but also have a team that could have the speed ceiling and the speed floor. For, I thought going into this um, format, I thought, yeah, Fluttermane is absolutely the best Pokemon there there is so okay what's the best way to abuse flutter main get speed control tailwind and just start nuking things with choice specs and i thought okay but in the previous regulation i also like pairing up flutter main with um urshifu so i have big dummy special attack damage and big dummy physical attack damage and then in order to protect the uh, in tailwind mode in order to protect both of them from not getting, like, so I can continuously keep pumping out damage, I wanted to have some way to block priority. And so it was either Furigraph or Ndidi. And I thought, okay, if I'm going to be in Tailwind mode, I feel like I can keep garnering more offensive pressure if I bring in an offensive Furigraph. So just like wolf i went with the throat spray set just so i can like also pump out hyper voices and Furgraph has like base 110 special attack so it will get the hyper voices will hurt the psy shock will ko things like water ogre pond as terror it got the special defense boost i don't care because i have the plus one psy shock against opposing flutter mains i'll just hit it on the physical side and then, um, I know just looking at, just like Nicola, I, I would presume he got influenced by Hoje. I saw that Blood Moon and Phoregraph paired well together. So I was like, okay, I could have, I have this speed, this fast offensive core with Tornadus, Urshifu, Fluttermane, Phoregraph. If I have Phoregraph on the on the field still and Tailwind's gonna expire, I can get the Trick Room up and get the Ursaluna Blood Moon in and just wreck everything, just clean up with the Blood Moon there. Because, because the Life Orb, Terra Normal, Hyper Voice damage is just goes crazy. The Suyan Arcanine is an interesting mon that I put on my team. I had trouble playing against like, um, Tailwind Chiyu, which was what Steven Mio was running. I, When I was like testing against that, I had problems with uh, Chiyu, Tornadus, Fluttermane teams because they get the Tailwind up. I'm forced to lead Fluttermane, and sometimes I'm not sure if I can KO the Terrifier um, Chiyu. So, okay, I needed a solid mon that can take on the Chiyu, but also kind of deal with Psy Spam in a way, and deal with Entei, because for, for test, I, I didn't get as much practice as I like to, and I found Entei to be a really troublesome Pokemon. Uh, the first thought that I had was to use Incineroar, but Incineroar... Parting can parting shot to Entei, but with how offensive I wanted to play, it didn't get rid of that Entei threat for me. So I decided, okay, maybe Hosui and Arcanine can deal with all those issues, especially with the Terra the Terra Dark. So with Terra Dark Assault Vest, I can take the Tachyon Cutter from Iron Crown, I can take the Dark Pulse or the Heat Wave from Shiyu. I and I can can survive the stomping tantrum from Entei, and I can hit back really hard with the Rock Slide onto the Shiyu and the Entei, and KO the Iron Crown with the Flare Blitz. And I would say this team just... I just... I'm not exactly sure 
how I ended up in top four. I, I just had to keep applying so much offensive pressure, especially with um, team preview. Uh, my first oh, comment yeah. is Ter Terra Dark Arcanine is just in center or at home. <laughs> it, it is, but you get Rock Slide. Rock Slide, it's, it's cool. It, it flinches. Uh, stab Rock yep, Slide is a lot of damage to throw out a board. Um, and if you want to mm -hmm. deal with Tornadus, uh, AV Arcanine's, uh, it's tough to do better. Um, so some, some, some comments and questions from chat. Uh, Rajans calls you a coward for an air slash Tornadus. Do you want to respond to that? Listen, man. <laughs> Rock Slide has a 30% chance to flinch. You know what else also has a 30% chance to flinch? Air Slash. And I can control my destiny with Air Slash. More so than Bleak Wind. I can control my destiny by getting the right Bleak Wind drop. I don't know about you, but like, uh, like good for you, I guess. He did better than me. I just don't miss no, that, I'm sure that's what Steve and Mia said, too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, just don't miss the bleak wins, but, you know, like you said, Steve and me have probably thought that, too. <laughs> the... Dude, testing, I missed so yeah. many bleak wins, I was like, screw this, I'm just going to go air slash. Um, we have uh, another question about why detect on Urshifu, is there a story behind that? Oh, originally I was using Stellar, Terra Stellar Urshifu, and I had Terra Blast in the last slot. And I just, and 15 to 20 minutes before the, the, for team lock-in for Charlotte, I decided, you know what, Terra Stellar really is ass on Urshifu. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to make it Terra Dark. So my, I'm using my cousin's switch. Thank you, Mosquito, for letting me hold on to your switch. And he had the Dark Terror Shard, so I Terror Darked it. But I was looking for filler moves to put on it. And he, it didn't have Iron Head. It didn't have Poison Jab. And it didn't have the materials for any of the good filler moves. So I was like, okay, what if I just put Detect there in case people misread my team sheet, forget that I have Choice Band on it. <laughs> that is not attacking really into it. <laughs> Did any opponents tell you that that had uh, messed them up? No, but I like to think it did. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I think Alex told the story um, after San Antonio, but he had protect on his specs flutter main, um, and before our three match, uh, the the judge came over to him and said, like. Do you, have a, do you have a team sheet error? Do you, are you supposed to have protect on your flutter main? <laughs> so. I, I got that. I think I got something like that once from one of my opponents, but it was good. It was good. I, I made sure. Mm -hmm. I made sure it's clear. Yes, it is detect. Yep. Uh, I you know I think U turn's a pretty good move on that guy, but fair enough. Detect definitely. Uh, uh you know what you know you, what if Incineroar knocks you off, right? You want to switch into your knockoffs? Yeah. Then, uh, there you are. It's a good knockoff. Legitimately good tech. It's it's you're hardly ever going to press the force move, so why not? Why not detect? I'm with Adi on this I one, but I'm glad it worked for you. Yeah, oh, wait, I'll be honest. Like... Did you click the fourth move? No. Okay. I thought I would, but there wasn't. Good. He didn't even have U-turn material, so I couldn't even oh, put wow. U-turn. So, one thing I'll say is, like, if I'm being honest, after 13, 14 rounds, there's a good chance you might have gotten me with the detect in the <laughs> choice band. You know, like these Pokemon tournaments run for a long time. Like, I, I could. There's always a chance of somebody getting fooled by it. So, you know, I respect that. Don't don't listen to them. <laughs> I feel like people are more likely. Okay, from my personal experience, at least. I so I'm not. I, everyone talked about how they did. Um, we'll talk more about so hype and Nick's team in a little bit. But uh, I went six three, and my last round opponent um, uh, had had a Cresselia, and they played around Dark Pulse on my Chiu the entire set, and I do not have Dark Pulse on my Chiu. Uh, they even Terra buried in front of it, um, and I, all I had was Snarl, uh, and so I almost <laughs> think that 
<laughs> not having to move is better because <laughs> people will misread the team sheet however they want to. They were just practicing for the global challenge. If you, <laughs> if the team sheets are a crutch. Um. All right, Arbin. Do you want to? I know you had, you had a pretty crazy day. I know you started out one two and then then basically didn't lose until the last round. Do you want to talk about your uh, your actual run a little bit? Uh, sure. So for my my round one, my opponent didn't really know how to play around Tailwind plus Ur Choice Band Urshifu, so I just just kept Wicked blowing into his Mons, and I just won it in less than. 10 minutes i was like really happy i'm like okay i finally got a win then round right, two wait, wait. starts i'm gonna i'm gonna cut you off really quickly i do not want a round by round recap i do not need 17 okay, okay. recaps oh true. okay true. <laughs> yeah okay, okay. Yeah, i just and then my, my brain turned off for the next two rounds or three rounds rather and i almost i legitimately almost lost to the mudslap Cresselia because her mons were super defensive and threw me for a loop somehow. <laughs> Especially when she priorityed, even though I had Furigraph. I was like, that was. And I even lost game one, turn one, lost both of my mons already. I was down 2 4 in this, on the second turn. But I, I think I decided, like, after that, just take it slow, just get. Just walk around, get my mental back together, and just take each game w one set at a time. Each game one set at a time. Just, just try my hardest just to win. And I just, I think as the more I kept playing throughout the rounds, the more games I played, I started to feel way more comfortable with how I'm playing the team. And then I just managed to squeak in the last win against Nora and make it into day two as the last seeded seven, two. And then during day two, I honestly, I've never played such an intense set of an intense tournament. Um, those six rounds in my life, I made really big gambles against everyone. Like I, against Logan, against Kazuki, Scott, Raga, Paul, and even against Steven, and just these gambles, these turn one high risk, high reward plays just ended up just paying so much dividends to me, and I just was able to win five more straight until Steven finally got me on turn three. I mean, on game three, where I thought his Tornadus was slow, but we were the same speed tornadoes and I he got tailwind off first before I could get the taunt on him. And that just he just bopped me with the speed advantage. And then mm -hmm. top eight was streamed, top four was streamed, and you could see what happened to me there. <laughs> yeah. That uh <laughs> The I know, I know Steven was not super happy after <laughs> after that top yeah. eight set, but uh, yeah, uh, but it's still a crazy crazy run. Congratulations again, um, and Thank you. yeah. So you mentioned you mentioned you know this is the first regional we've had six rounds of day two Swiss. Uh, yeah. I know all of us have have played uh, you know a couple events now in day two. How did how did y'all feel playing playing six rounds? Do you feel like it was a noticeably noticeably more difficult, more strenuous? Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, I was so exhausted. I still am. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I played nine rounds the day before. Six rounds is just three fewer. Um, it's just more Pokemon. I'm fine with it. But I guess I'm outnumbered here. So, yeah. It's your secret, Nails, because mm -hmm. I was, like, dead after two, three rounds. <laughs> uh, I got, like, uh, really solid sleep the night before. Um, between day one and day two, and so that probably helped me out. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, got there. It was... I, I yeah. don't know. Yeah, that's the secret I was missing, too, I think. Yeah. That's what I'm going to focus on next time. Sleep. 
Yeah, hundred mm-hmm. percent. Get that rust TM. Oh. <laughs> 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 so I, was like, I didn't fold my laundry. It's funny because you have the background on it and we can kind of see it in the background, just barely. No. <laughs> Every time you turn your chair, we see it come out and disappear. <laughs> hey, I had to do my laundry, you know, just didn't have the... I could yeah, only do yeah. one thing, okay? I could either do the laundry or I could fold the laundry, so... And, and I'm glad that Today you chose to be on top takes instead of doing laundry. Um... <laughs> yeah, I got my priorities straight. <laughs> So, uh, so let's talk about Steven's team. Um, moving on, uh, I this is a team that I think a lot of people also uh, were, we're talking up. We saw Zomog do very well in the Victory Road Tour. We talked about that last week with uh, pretty much the same team, but with a Heatsweet Arcanine over the Chiyu. Um, I know I be, I use these same six Pokemon at this regional. I know me, Justin Tang, Chapa were building it, and we built it. At, we ended up building it out slightly differently, but um, but uh, the. Um, I, I do think that this version is a little better. I'd say that, you know, me and Chuppa and, and Jesse and, you know, the four, four of the five of us didn't make the two, especially we talk about a player of Chuppa's caliber. Uh, you know, kind of, kind of ex- it maybe is a, maybe something about how we ended up building it out. Justin also, I think, got only top 64. And he's a player who could easily have top cut. Uh, and so I do think that I, I, Steven's choices were a little better. But this team is a team that I think everyone um, who was... Uh, you know, kind of in the know, had been on high ladder on Showdown, had been paying attention to victory road results, had uh, had been um, aware of, was going around. Um, I think that the way that Steven built it out, I think Kyle um, built it, built the same, used the same team, um, and Rob and probably a few other people were in that group uh, who built it out this way. Uh, they had a, a really, really strong version of it, and this is probably the strongest version of it that I've seen so far using the Specs Chiyu uh, as the, the, in the fire type slot. Uh, and so... Yeah, Glamora does a lot of damage. It, it hits really, really hard with the Meteor Beam. Um, and I think the Sunny Day Tornadus. So teams are, a lot of teams not using Sunny Day right now, um, despite the fact that there is a booster energy on Fluttermane, still having Sunny Day. So not this, not, um, not, not a, I don't know, not a set that would benefit. So the Fluttermane is not benefiting from Sunny Day, but really it's the Chiyu that's really the, uh, the beneficiary. And I know that is also mostly for the, um, the Tricker matchups where you just kind of get to overpower them a lot of times with, uh, with Sun Boosted overheats or sun boosted heat waves really try to deny trick room in a lot of ways as well as any other team that really just can't deal with sun boosted heat waves so um this team very very high power level uh we also we called it casino because you have a lot of moves that can miss missing meteor beams is deadly i know two of my three losses at the tournament i i lost a game because i missed a meteor beam um missing heat waves missing snarls missing overheats missing icy winds all suck missing bleak wind storms as we saw in top eight sucks like you have so many moves that can miss you cannot expect to hit all of them and um uh i mean that's not you, you usually will miss one of them and you usually have to and the, the power level is generally high enough to overcome that but um but yeah I, it's really easy to uh have a round or two that is that you where you get unlucky and you um <laughs> and you, you it, it, and you have to be very a very good player to overcome that and we saw steven is is the player who was able to do that uh, and get all the way to top eight but Again, this is a team that I think you should be ready for, especially going into Knoxville. There were a bunch of people. I think there were like eight people who had this exact same six Pokemon. I can pull that up on um, on Top Cut Explorer. Uh, but I think there were there were like eight people who had had this exact team in day two of this tournament, um, and maybe a lot more. Let's see: Fluttermane, Tornadus, uh, Ogre Pond, Urshifu, Glamora. So fourteen people, fourteen people got points with this exact combination of uh, Pokemon. And you see um, one, two, three, four, five people made it to day two with this exact combination of Pokemon. And I believe that there were two others who were using um, not Chiyu in that slot. Uh, I can pull up that, I guess, too. Yeah, there were... Yeah. Uh, in chapter 56, there were four Arcanine Hazui, four Ente, and 14 Chiyu. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, this team, it was kind of everywhere. This tournament and uh, a lot of people made day two with it and so uh yeah it's a scary team the Entei version i think eric rios popularized uh and then the he's been arcanine version was popularized by by zomok and then uh the chiyu version is kind of what popped up as a response to the farigraph matchup that i think we were also scared of but uh yeah any any thoughts on this team um i ran uh something that was similar to it but um like i'll comment on this one specifically um yeah, it just it, 
like you mentioned, uh, a lot of inaccurate moves, um, and it it just has a lot of power. And you say that um, I am going to have the strongest strategy when I hit, and that will overcome the matchups where I miss uh, because I am allowed to lose one uh, game per set to inaccuracy. Um, and uh, if I just hit all my moves, then I have the best team at the tournament. Um, and that was, uh, I mean, that was my mindset with loading up one more as well. And, uh, like when it, it works, it works and it's really powerful and you can blow out games and it is a lot of pressure to respond to. Um, I was surprised to see the fire terror on Chiyu. Um, a lot of the Chiyus in the tournament were, uh, terror ghost and, um, I'm not sure that the Furgriff matchup is actually fine because, uh, Terrifier on Chiyu just means that, uh, like all of the Furgraf teams have fake out next to the Furgraf and they have, uh, fake out trick room as an option. And, uh, I don't think this team really has a way to respond to that, uh, unless I'm missing something. Uh, like you can, I suppose you can lead, uh, Chiyu plus, uh, Darkfu. And double dark move for a graph and force it to Terra Fairy, but that's about the best I can come up with. Um, and so um, I'm just curious about that. Uh, I know that Kyle also had Terra Fire on the Chiyu, and I found that a bit curious. Uh, but um, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I'm pretty sure Kyle is the same team. Um, again, yeah. uh, my, the take that Justin Chapa and I had on it was Terra Ghost, and uh, that was to avoid the fake out. But you can you can. The, the idea was that if you Terra the... If they have to Terra to get Trick Room up, then we can survive Trick Room because they can't Terra normal the Ursa Luna. And if they don't Terra to get Trick Room up, then we probably lose. Um, just because they get to click Terra normal helping and Hyper Voice and power through our team. Um, so that was that was the reason for... Uh, for um, that, that was the mentality going into it, at the very least. Uh, sure. I don't think I ever Terra Ghosted my Chiyu. And I, we, we talked about Terrifier, and I do wish we red run Terrifier in hindsight, because mostly because having it be a Flutter main resist is very, very useful when this team does not really have fairy resists other than Glamora. Um, uh, sure. I can buy that. Um, yeah. And then Justin says in chat that he did actually add Spadef to improve the Meteor Beam roll, um, which, uh, yeah, so that's the other thing, is that Chiu... Uh, boosting Glamora's Meteor Beam is another way to actually KO the uh, the figure for graph. And uh, I think that we had more special attack investment than Stevens did uh, on Glamora. Um, obviously, we were Life Orb Chiu, so we weren't doing as much damage to Fergraph with our overheats. But um, that is another way where uh, we could, you know, overheat the Redirector and then Meteor Beam the uh, Fergraph. And that worked a lot of times. And I think Justin ran into Justin on ladder enough that Justin made th that, that just Justin. Um, Justin Tang ran into Justin Burns on ladder enough that Justin Burns changed the set, uh, <laughs> uh, which is a which is a funny funny little thing that happened. Um, yeah, yeah. J uh, Justin says J Justin Burns says he lived the overheat from Chapa, which yes, uh, we we and yeah, we were on the same team, right? So yeah. Um, any other, did you did y'all face this team a lot, Arvin? I'm sure you I'm sure you must see a couple of them, right? Uh, I only played. Steven, who had the, this team, and honestly, going into Charlotte, I felt like this felt like the team that could have won the tournament, especially with how Steven was Wolf's only loss. When playing against it, I felt like I had to play way differently than I wanted to, because just like Chad, you would nails, you, Chad's mentioning the Meteor Beat, the threat of my Furigraph, since it's very offensive, I couldn't reliably get a Trick Room off because of my Furigraph is just going to faint from just the Meteor Beam or an Overheat or Sunny Day Heat Wave or something like that. But even in Tailwind mode, because he has a speed boosting Flutter Main, if he gets an offensive threat next to um, the speed booster Flutter Main, I can't really deal with it um with that offensive threat because now he would always have the speed advantage i just felt 
this team just felt like overwhelming to play against and i had to really think outside of the box just to get a chance um to get yeah to get a chance to just beat him i will say ironically i think the thing this team has the hardest that time with is actually pow Knight. i i i played two pow Knights and i lost to both of them and Yes, those were the two matches where I, I missed a meteor beam, but like that that felt like the the matchup where I had the uh, the smallest margins against personally. Um, so yeah, Chun Po is a lot of pressure for the comp. Um, you just uh, dealing with the focus ash is um, pretty tricky. Uh, you have toxic spikes that theoretically can go up, but having uh, having the toxic spikes be useful against Chun Po is um, very situational um mm -hmm. and it, so you can you can play to it right but a lot of times they will just lead the chen pao knowing that you have to uh knowing that you don't get it off and otherwise otherwise they just will simply not hit the glamora right and so yeah, with a physical it attack. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It, it's it's pretty optimistic to assume that toxic spikes will matter they can but uh usually it just leads to um having lines that uh your opponent isn't allowed to go for and they have to pick alternate options which can be sometimes used against them but requires a lot of uh deliberate setup and uh, honestly just outplaying your opponent to get to that point i will i will so. tell one quick story where i in one of my losses a game three uh i had a one hp urshifu in front of a dragonite um and i was and they were like they were assault best they were not they were not locked into e-speed um and i was like oh they're just gonna e-speed my urshifu uh to, because they don't want to, you know, take the eighty percent from this this uh, wicked blow, uh, and so I switched it into my Glamora, thinking, yeah, now now their power back is going to lose its sash when it switches in. Um, the ESPs can do negligible damage. Uh, they stomping tantrumed. They they called it and they uh they hit the uh they they are like, yeah, it doesn't matter as long as I don't let them get spikes up. I guess I I don't know. It was just a it's like a really smart call, but yeah, people will people good players will play around it, you know. So it yeah, uh, Pound Knight was a real pain for this, and um, yeah. Uh, all right. Um, we uh, we're we taking a little longer to talk about all these teams than would have hoped, but we can we can go through the rest of the top eight, and then we can talk about the uh the the Sohive and, and Nails' team, and then we can talk about maybe some of the the highlights real quick. But let's let's talk about um let's real quick. Uh, Enzo's team. Uh, I know Enzo and uh and Enzo and um Ian Ian McLaughlin have been running sort of the smear gold blood moon sort of team for a little bit. I think uh, one of them did really well at Portland. Or maybe two, I think both of them made two, two at Portland with it as well. Yes, um, I actually faced Ian round one. Um, and round one started about an hour later than it was supposed to. So I had an hour to look at uh, at Ian's team sheet from Portland and to figure out a game plan. And I don't think I would have beaten him without that. Um, but uh, this is a very spooky team. Congrats to Enzo for uh, for cutting this regional with it. Um, the tornadoes Smeargle combination. Again, a little high variance, but very, very powerful. And Smeargle actually gives a lot of room for Urshifu to work. Uh, it was a, it was a very very scheme to, very very scary team to face off against. Yeah, um, Smeargle has not been uh, around all gen and uh, was not. I think it just straight up wasn't in Gen eight. So you have to be a bit of a VGC boomer uh, to have any experience playing against Smeargle at this point. Um, your first time playing against uh, the combination of uh, Fake Out, Spore, Follow Me, and Wide Guard while it has a focus ash is a bit of a trip um and if you give it too much time it's going to moody uh through you and uh both ian and enzo are very uh practiced smear goal players from way back in the day so they are going to just um if you make a misstep uh they're gonna take a game off it pretty much uh the team is uh, honestly it just looks uh this is straight out of the Smeargle playbook. It's got uh, a bunch of tools that are uh, going to pump out damage um, and capitalize on the free turns that Smeargle can generate um, and Torn as well. And uh, it's um, if you know precisely what to do against Smeargle, um, they can still just hit their mix-ups and win anyways. Um, if you don't know what you're going to do against it, they're going to farm. Um, and that was, I, I talked to Ian a decent amount this weekend, and that's how he described the team. And uh, that's 
pretty much uh, what the team does, and uh, it mm -hmm. carried Enzo to top eight, and Ian uh, had an uh, okay run, but uh, as mentioned, he had an unfortunate loss to Adi uh, because Adi made use of his resources in his time, and, um, uh, and just stuff didn't go his way, and yeah, it's a powerful concept. Uh, uh, think about your Smeagol wands, everybody. They're, uh, they're, it, it's tough to deal with. Um, Smeargle is a mon that we thought might get worse in open team sheet. Uh, but this type of set where it's not trying to do anything tricky and it's just trying to... Uh, it's got its tools to address the board state and Terror Ghost is just very good on it. Um, th this is a mon that benefits from open team sheet, for sure. Uh, it doesn't have to play around goggles. Uh uh, potentially being there. It just knows where they are. Um, this, yeah, I've, uh, I'm impressed by the comp and by, uh, just, uh, how good some of your goals. Uh, it's still not something I, uh, really enjoy playing, but, uh, like they did a good job with the team. Um, I also heard, so again, my, my match matchup game two, Smeargo got to plus six pedef and I realized I couldn't kill it. That is a thing that it can do with Moody. Um, I think someone else said they lost to Enzo because it got to plus six speed against them. Um, I think I think I think Robbie said that he played either Ian or Enzo. I forget. I, I don't remember exactly who it was, but yeah, uh, Moody is still very scary, even though it can't give evasion boost. It, it really can um, swing a matchup. So Smeargle still here. <laughs> also, very Terrible Ente is pretty cool too. I didn't even see that. Yeah, um, I was running Ente at. Uh... Portland and it was something we considered. I ended up going with Snarl and Terra Normal, but um, on a team where the only resist resistances to be had are uh, on the Ente pretty much. Uh, Golden Go has a couple as well of relevant um, resistances. Uh, you you want to be able to have your Assault Vest guy live as long as possible and Terra Fairy is a pretty good way to do that. Um, and it mm -hmm. gives the team some fairy coverage to snipe dragons if you need it. True. Uh, cool and so, yeah, with that, let's move on to the uh, next top eight team, which was uh, Toller, who was using um, Psy Spam, sort of. Very, uh, I, I think that you know he has, he has a really good thread talking about how he and Justin Karras and a couple other people built out this team. Um, and they apparently had pretty much this team uh to uh re ready in like december in december and kind of tried to keep it on the down low justin did some uh some some tweeting try to keep people to <laughs> make people think it was a little worse than it was i know that uh but yeah i, I don't i'm not going to talk too much about this team because again toller describes you know has a rental code up here of course and then talks pretty extensively about uh about how they how they built the team um and and how he played the team but I will I will link this in chat if you want to read about it. Uh, so Hive, I know you you played against this in the win and in on stream. Did you have any have any thoughts about this team? It's a super cool team, yeah. yeah. Played against Toller in day one too, and yeah, if you like, if you get caught out of position, it can just like overwhelm you really really quickly. So you have to be like really really careful about your board positioning and really careful about the mods you bring. Is because if you're not bringing the right mods, like like in my game one against Toler, like I didn't have good size spam, like expanding with four switch in. So as soon as I saw his lead, I was like, well, I lose game one right here. So so you have to be really careful with the positioning, the mods you bring, the moments you Terra, because like for example, I had Terra Grass and Lingus, sorry Terra Dark, so I had to be really careful tearing it in front of the Urshifu, so or the Flutter main, so. Yeah, it's just uh, it's a very scary team if you like if you let it get out of position. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so uh, again, size spam definitely still around. Uh, I was don't, don't tell Rajan, um, but that, that Iron Crown is, is is still good. But <laughs> Rajan was saying I was talking okay. to Rajan after the event. He was saying that the uh, the Iron Crown is the worst part of his team. Um, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then rounding out top eight, we have uh, the team that Neil used. Uh, I know Darsh Patel also made day two with this, and Darsh said that one of Neil and, and he, or he would make top cut guaranteed. 
Um, this was at, you know, midnight at a bar, and Darsh did not wake up in time for day two. So it was, of course, had to be Neil that made top cut, and he did. But uh, this team is uh, is very, very strong. Um, and uh, yeah, the uh, I know I also know that we play this team. Uh, I think I think Justin played this team on ladder uh, and uh, um, and posted it in our group chat. Justin Tang, um, I was like, yo, this is so hard. Uh, the assault vest raging bolt, just like, just we we struggled so much against it, we could not beat it. Um, and he was like, how do I beat this? And we were watching the replays, like, I don't know, I don't know. This might just be a we might just have to take the L against this. Um, so this team was very very scary to face down for sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, Assault Vest Raging Bolt put in a lot of work. It's one of the uh, stronger uh, Pokemon, in my opinion, that can use the uh, Amoongus and Cinnaroar core. It's really, that's, a, that's something that everyone is really scared of um, going into the format, Amoongus and Cinnaroar. Um, and it hasn't really popped up. It hasn't done well. It's very passive generally, um, maybe in this more fast-paced format, but this is the first real performance for it. And so, uh, yeah, it's cool to see it do well. And of course, we do see the um, Neil's signature Pokemon, the, uh, the, the you know, booster terrifying Rory Moon. I feel like he's used that for, for forever now. Um, so he's super, super comfortable with that as well. Uh, any thoughts on this team? Um, I 2 it in day one. I, uh, Darsh was uh, my round three opponent. Um, but uh, aside from that, no, it's... Uh, I'm just toying around. That doesn't really mean much. Uh, but yeah, no, it's a very solid team. and uh, Like... Uh, Neil had a great run in day two, and uh, Darsh had a great one in day, great run in day one. And so, um, like they, uh, uh, it's just well rounded. It has good type coverage, um, and uh, it's just uh, good Pokemon. Um, it's uh, it's got the defense, like you mentioned, and just uh, has uh, solid defensive tools to respond to stuff. Uh, and in a format like this, uh, uh, where with like a lot of offensive pressure coming from a lot of different directions, uh, being able to just have defensive tools and perform well with it uh, is an achievement in its own right. So uh, congrats to them. Uh, double dark types is a cool touch um, with Sensen and the Ring Moon. Uh, uh, Psy spam is gonna have a really tricky time with that. Um, uh, having two knockoff users uh, is great support for Amoongus. Uh, you can just get rid of uh, safety goggles and uh, get back to your game plan of scoring through everything. Um, and Roaring Moon in particular can also, I guess, Ensign as well. Uh, they can blow up uh, Terra Grass Mons uh, with uh, Flare Blitzer Acro. So, yeah, just. Um, supporting the Amoongus so that it can be uh, just it can just be in positions to uh, sleep everything and then uh, heal off the, the damage trade that you had to take to get rid of the goggles is just um, it's a good play that uh, it spins the sweet uh, sleep uh, RNG wheel but um, that uh, spinning that wheel tends to go favorably for the for the Amoongus player because sleep is a broken mechanic. Um, mm -hmm. And also, it, yes. uh, Ogre Pond is the other guy that Amoongus has a really hard time with. Ogre Pond Fire, Ogre Pond Water, anything with the redirection. Um, and Roaring Moon is crazy into those guys. We haven't seen this uh, Roaring Moon have a ton of usage, but there are not a ton of things that can that can uh, threaten an Oko on Ogre Pond. Uh, there's not a ton of flying types that or have that any mods that have real flying damage out there. And Roaring Moon is one of the very few Pokemon. Yes, it's a little bit of a Terra Hog, but it's one of the very few Pokemon that can really threaten an Ogre Pond Wellspring. Um, and it can also set up on that Ogre Pond Wellspring or Ogre Pond Fire. And so that is something else that uh, really, really works well with the Moongus. Yep. Um, just a, a pretty sound team. Uh, and uh, something Neil's very familiar with playing. And he, he's back at it again and uh, snuck into top eight in part uh, due to a buy in round one of day two. Um, he got an unresistance over Rajan and Rajan was uh, a bit annoyed by that, but um, it, like it, it is what it is, and uh, the fact that uh, like there isn't a huge difference between eighth and ninth in, in these tournaments, and so um, it's just uh, he, uh, he, Neil just had a really solid run. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to take anything away from him. Just like all of the 12 and 3 players uh, had great tournaments. Yeah. Uh, now, I don't, uh, we don't really have time to talk about, um, about Rajan, sorry, Rajan, or Jody, uh, but I'm going to skip down to, to Sohaib because uh, you've been sitting here very patiently. Tell, tell me about your team and your, uh, your run a little bit. Uh, I honestly, after round five, I felt like I was playing at Worlds or something. Because <laughs> looking at every, all of my friends' runs, they had like the most freest tournament. <laughs> Day one, while I was like after round five, just fighting for my life. Like each round, I see a name. I'm like, holy crap! Like, what the hell is this? You know. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it was an insane tournament. Uh, day one went like you know, as you can see, really well. Played out of my mind. Day two, I lost to like you know Luca and Nick. Games were insanely close. You know, it could have went either way, but uh, they played really, really well. And yeah, it's just, you know, not my day, but definitely took some whole good lessons from here. Just uh, more about like sleeping a lot and having like a good night of sleep and just being like, you know, well rested. I feel like that's something now I have to work on for the next tournament. But team overall was really good. That's what kind of makes me sad because I feel like it was definitely felt like a tournament winning team. But yeah, it's just, uh, you know wasn't my day and the funny thing is um i had almost dropped this team because um hoj uh, his version of blood moon was really really hard for my team to beat so um i had dropped it and i had gotten on with you like with adi and like chapa and everybody and but like that team was really really hyper offensive and i can't really use hyper offensive teams really well so i like on showdown, my rating like tanked from 1600s to 1298 in like the span of two days, and I was just like, uh, <laughs> I'm, "I'm gonna bomb this tournament if I take that team." So um, then I just went back to the stuff I knew. I was like, "If I'm going to bomb, I'll bomb with something I know." And guess what? I only played one Blood Moon all tournament. So you know, I guess dodging it is a real. Real thing, if you guys ever feel like you have a bad matchup, just, just say you're not going to face it. That's what's going to happen. And uh, and yeah, um, another thing. Um, I found out the power of Urshifu Arc Tornadus last week, and I was like, holy shit, this game becomes so much easier when you have a Pokemon that doesn't care about Protect. <laughs> you know, you just like, set up Tailwind and attack. It's like, wow. Like, I, I didn't use Urshifu. I only use Urshifu once in Reg D, but except that I didn't use Torn or Urshifu, and it's just uh, my eyes were open last week. I was like, "Holy crap!" Mm-hmm. N- anything happens, I'm using an Urshifu and a Tailwind, you know. But uh, yeah, so and then I put Arcanine. Rock coverage was really, really good, and first four or five rounds was just basically Tailwind, Head Smash, Head Smash, till the Arcanine fainted. Then you bring in our, our Shifu and that's it. So like for me, like my balance games last too long. So it's like with this team, I was like I was so fresh by round four and five. I was like, holy crap, like you know, I've never felt this fresh before. <laughs> you know, my games were getting done really, really quick, so yeah. Um not much else to say, but yeah. It was overall a good time. Well, another another uh, A V Bolt Amoongus team, I think were y'all the two highest placing Amoonguses uh, in the tournament? Um, no, there was another. There was another Amoongus on a on a Gadget Fire team as well, uh, and Paul Chua, of course. Who was he on the same team as you? How, how similar was his team? Yeah, uh, no, his his was quite different. Yeah, his, his was a little different. Yeah, his was quite different. Um, so yeah. maybe not, maybe not as much of a trend, but I definitely I talked to you about your team, but then I saw that uh, I saw that Neil also had cut with AV Raging Bolt Amoongus, and I thought, you know, hey, maybe that's the combo. Um, that makes uh, Amoongus yeah. a little better because again, Amoongus is such a strong Pokemon, and um, and not really seeing the usage that you'd expect it to right now. So uh, mm-hmm. it's cool, and I know I know this yeah, is a comfort that... pick for you. I know you were thinking about using uh, Casino like like the rest of us with Glamora, mm-hmm. um, and kind of deviated back to a uh, to comfort, and it served you really well. Yeah, I think this is a comfort type of format. Like we have like as you see like the top eight. Like there's so many different teams. I feel like, and all of them are viable too. So it's like, I feel like 
knowing your team well and knowing how to navigate matchups is just the uh, i think that's the you know that's the way to go like for example i played <laughs> my good friend don he was running hail team you know like articuno like even that was a good team too it's like you know there's so much good stuff going around like i feel like just knowing your matchups really well is really really good and uh one thing that I'm kind of sad about is like, I wanted to be the Arcanine's strongest soldier, but Arvin got the title. You know, I was so <laughs> close. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy that Arcanine still got a good showing. So yeah, yeah. All right. With that, Nails, it's your turn. Um, you want to talk really quickly about your team and your your tournament experience? Yeah, sure. So. Um... Uh, I was looking at Portland uh, results uh, and Screamtail, my buddy Stax, uh, Anton Galkin, um, uh, got a top four at, uh, with Screamtail. And I was like, that's cool. I, I like that guy and I uh, wanted to use him. Uh, and Glamour was also popping up. Uh, Meteor Beam is an unfair move. And uh, I uh, talked about this on my stream interview as well. But um, Screamtail and Glamour just have a bunch of really nifty synergy. Uh, Screamtail just wants to get the game to a 2v2 endgame because it uh, just straight up wins those endgames. Uh, that, that is its uh, shtick, is that if he can get uh, into a 2v2, Screamtail just wins. Um, Glamour uh, shoots a guy in the face, and getting shot in the face is hard for uh, <laughs> anything to deal with. Um, I've never been shot in the face before, but I assume it wouldn't go well. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, other like Lando, I uh, it um, I guess the third man on the team was uh, Torn because Torn Glim is just good. Uh, it makes you go fast so that you can be really fast when you shoot a guy in the face, which is uh, also pretty cool. Um, and just Bleak Wind is a, an unfair move. Um, it just deals way too much damage for the uh, uh, to also be on a guy that has Prankster Talent. So um, the, those were my first three mons. Uh, Wellspring, uh, the synergy with... Uh, uh, not exactly synergy, but just... Uh, uh, yeah, no, it's it's pretty good offensive and defensive synergy with uh, Glamour. So it was a uh, pretty straightforward inclusion. My Mon 5 was Landorus because um, I wanted to support Screamtail at least like reasonably well. And uh, Scream and Glim and Torn all kind of get walled by uh, Goldengo. So I wanted to make sure that I had uh, reasonably good uh, tools into Goldie. Uh, like Goldie redirection was just shredding some of the other versions of the comp. And so I was not really willing to compromise on Landorus. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, it just embraces the casino element of the team, where uh, if you uh, hit all your moves, you uh, jackpot and you like win your round. Um, and uh, but it's also not forced to go for sand seer storms. It just like has earth power to fall back on, and uh, if you just need to hit a move. And so uh, uh, I did have to go for sand seer storms in a decent amount of positions. Uh, there were some other positions where I chose to. Um, like, uh, to, I chose to go for Sansir Storm instead of uh, getting a call right like uh, at the end of my game while I'm in my stream set. Uh, there was just a gadging fire and a Torkoal um, that I had to remove. And instead of... Uh, like, I could have just earth the Torkoal if I knew both of them were attacking, but Sansir Storm did the job, and I hit both. And out there. Um, but yeah, uh, just uh, Landris does unfair damage. Terra Steel was quite good on it because Steel is a broken typing. Um, it just has like 10 resistances and they come up a lot because uh, uh, like <laughs> it's half of the types in the game. Like Steel is going to find useful times to resist things. Uh, it's still a flutter resist and it also um, it's an extreme speed resist and those were two of the main ones that I wanted to uh, go for, but like, I think eight out of the ten resistances are like meta relevant. Um, make it rain, uh, being a blood moon resist, and so you can hide it behind a wall spring. 
and just get a shot onto Blood Moon in Trick Room um, can be enough to keep up your tempo in Trick Room and then uh, clean up with uh, something else uh, after Trick Room expires. Just um, Terra Steel Lando is great. Uh, would not change it. Highly recommend. Um, Mon 6 uh, Gambit just uh, was uh, also there. It had an eye towards um, what's it? Uh, Goldengo. Um, it also uh, like I cared about opposing King Gambit uh, since I didn't have a fighting move on the team yet. And so a little kick just hits that. Um, and it's uh, it was described uh, as Thanos by uh, Grandma's Cooking, who's a friend that I showed the team to, and he recommended PV Gambit. Um, and it's a mod that I've used a bunch uh, back in Reg B and C, and uh, he's just one of my besties, and so I was more than happy to throw it on the team. And Gambit did great work. Uh, Assurance, uh, just uh, like it's the slowest mod on the team, and there's a lot of spread damage, um, uh, like. Three of the mons have uh, just a spread move that they're comfortable clicking uh, to set up assurance. Um, there was an uh, there was a version of the team that considered Sludge Wave as well on Glamora, and I was agonizing over that choice on Friday. I decided to go with Sludge Bomb because it uh, I, I didn't think the everyone team everyone yelled at you. <laughs> uh, no, there was, it was pretty split. Um, between Sludge Wave is based and Nick, you're stupid, stop it. Um, I eventually decided to just uh, uh, go with the team as uh, the, the conservative version of the team, and the team was good enough to um, make a run through the tournament without having to gamble on trying to raise the ceiling of the team. But yeah, um, as for my run, um, I played one of the softest schedules I've ever played. No disrespect to any of my opponents, especially ones that I played twice. Um, but um, <laughs> like, just uh, overall, um, it was like my run to seven and zero. Uh, uh, Will and Abinet, uh was not a name that I recognized, and uh, he, uh, he he made a deep run, um, uh, and Darsh also made day two. So, uh, in retrospect, it was a bit stronger than I looked, and like. There were a bunch of solid records on my day one uh, performance, but um, just not a bunch of names that I uh, recognized. Um, but uh, and then my day two schedule was like fine, um, but yeah, um, really that's just uh, uh, I picked Screamtail partly because I thought that people would be unprepared for it, and I wanted to uh, farm players that didn't know how to play against Greentail, much like uh, Ian had some, Ian and Enzo had some success uh, playing against Smear, uh, playing with Smear Goal against people who were unfamiliar with it. And honestly, I think I hit on my meta call of people don't know how to play against uh, Weird Disruption. And so, yeah, that was pretty much my tournament. Uh, I don't regret anything about the team. The team was very good. Yeah, I have to say, like, his scream tail was such a pain in the ass every time I've both the sets I played him. I think your scream tail was the one that got the most KOs, too, against in both the sets, I think. Yeah, yeah no, I remember just... game three in the second set. Um, <laughs> it was just uh, scream tail picked up three KOs in the end game. Three, like, yeah. I, I, I got a good uh, encore into your rage powder, I think, in yep. game three, and then just. Uh, Flutter, Urshifu, and uh, were both in range of uh, Dazzling Gleam, and uh, just the position was pretty locked. Yeah, it was just, yeah, I was just so confident that the Terror of Wicked Blow was going to KO your Ogre Pawn. When it's oh, around, yeah, I was like, oh. uh, um, it was, yeah, I was a roll that ended up, yeah, being, but I was just yeah. like, that just made a 50, but yeah, it was a that screen tail was a monster. Yeah, it it put in a lot of work, and mm -hmm. I can recommend it. I'm unsure if I'm going to post a team report on it, but um, uh, potentially look out for that. I'll announce it if it's, and you can. Uh, it'll be on Adi's channel if it comes out. Uh, it's to be determined. We'll see. Uh, 
but yeah. So with that, I do. So again, we have we've gone over a little bit um, last time. Instead of doing uh, instead of doing Calca's right, we did some trivia about uh, usage stats in the tournaments. I think are y'all are y'all interested in doing that instead of Calca's right? Um, I have not had a chance to prepare that. Uh, so I I'll, I'll leave it to Arvin and said so I'm good with either. <laughs> but I will be very rapidly preparing if that's what we're doing. So, I'm sorry. I, I, I missed the first part. <laughs> what did you ask? I said, so So a couple of weeks ago after after Portland, instead of doing the Calcas right, we did uh, we did some trivia from some usage stats that I pulled from Lab Mouse. Uh, are y'all interested in doing mm-hmm. that? So you don't have to think of a Calcas. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done for this. Yeah. Oh, right. wait, do I not I, have I, to come up with my no, no, you don't have to come up with your own. I'm just, oh. gonna, I'll just, I'll just ask. Oh, okay, questions. sure, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, as long as it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess before we do that, I want to give a shout out to some of the more interesting teams that did pretty well in the tournament. Um, obviously, a shout out to all the tubbers that did very well. Uh, shout out to Scott for using uh, Porygon Two Instant Shroom over here and getting top sixteen. That was a a very cool team that did very well. Um, uh, if y'all have any names that you want to shout out, by all means, um, I want to shout out Brendan for using Iron Jugulus. Uh, that guy has not been good since the last Charlotte Regionals, um, and and he, he used it to uh, to a really good run. Wait, uh, shout out to my uh, Are you talking about Brendan or Iron Jugulus? He said that Jugulus, not Brendan. Sorry, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> no, I meant Jugulus. Jugulus was okay. it was useful was for like n- it, it was good for like two weeks at the in the end of Reg B. And I know I, I made it too at, uh, at Charlotte with it. I know a few other, I think some, one of them, maybe one of them caught Charlotte. And then it was good previously at Knoxville and Stuttgart when Marcus won Stuttgart with it. Um, and that was it. And then it never saw the light of day again until just now. Um, okay, so it was cool to see that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, shout out to, shout out to my boy, Don Check. He literally was thinking about not going to this regional. I had to talk him into driving up. Uh, and he made day two uh, with, uh, with, with Articuno, Ninetales, Magmar, super super sick team. Really really happy that, that he did as well. He's been grinding the uh, the Alola Tales Articuno since Reg E, maybe since before that. Honestly, um, with he had a Shiftry on the team for Battle Spot for a long time, and then um, and now he decided Shiftry. Maybe not it anymore, but uh, put the Magmar on the team and did very very well with it as well. Well, just uh, I just have to say yeah. something about his team is that the Articuno is a damn monster. You know, it hits so hard. I had, like, game one against him. I thought Terra Dark Wicked Blow would, like, knock it out. And it did, like, a solid maybe 60% to it. And I was just, like... And he just knocked me out with a blizzard. And I was, like... It's just, yeah. like, it was shocking how good that mod is. That's the snow buff right there. Yeah. Oh, so so the defense buff does get into... Take it into account yep. with the crits, too. Okay. Yeah, it's just, like, yep, uh, yep. sand uh, with Tyranitar. Uh, yeah, okay. It, it just uh, has extra bulk. Team Rocket that, that makes asked, sense. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. Team Rocket Elite asked what happened to Dendozo this regional. Not a single one made day two. There were zero of them. I know a couple of them lost their winning, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it did. It did not do very well this regional. It, I will say part of it is probably that uh, players like Choppa did not end up using it this regional, and that probably contributed to it. Um, but uh, yeah, nature is healing, you know. <laughs> oh, uh, people were just paying attention to it. Um, it, it got through uh, last time, uh, and people just didn't pack their dozo checks. And uh, this time, like this time around, uh, it did well at the last turn. So people probably tended to pack more dozo checks. I know I had it as something I had in mind when I picked Scream Tail, um, and just wanted to like having an auto win against dozo in one mod was. A pretty big sell, and it's uh, yeah. I assume that other players had similar thoughts of Dozo is not really something I want to lose to. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's so it, it's a it, it's a matchup check on, um, and Chepa will uh, tell you the same. It's just he got in and got out of his Dozo stonks. Chepa actually was very close to abandoning our team for Conkledonk's Dozo team. The, uh, which he did, yeah. he did, Ruchel did really well at the PC the night before the tournament, and like, Chubb was like, "Is that the sauce? Should I be using that?" <laughs> and maybe he should have. He went six three instead. <laughs> so, uh, I I, I want to talk about. 
Uh, shout out to uh, to Zach for using uh, dual screens Hatterin. Uh, without Indeedy, you see Hatterin, you think size spam. No, he put it on a he put it on a Ursula Trick Room team and and did very well with it. Went I think eleven four with it. Uh, so that was really cool to see as well. Um, there were two guy. gap. Uh, yeah, I was just going Sorry. to say uh, the Sword Stand Zorark team. Don't forget about that one. Oh, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm just scrolling through day two. I'm pretty sure they're the very guy day two. <laughs> okay, yeah, I know. That's, that's the team that needs to be brought to light, too. Sorry. We'll, we'll get there. Uh, yeah, uh, there were two oh, Galarian cool. Zapdos in day two. I did want to point that out. Um, I, I didn't... I, I see uh, Aaron Clemens. I think there was one more. Uh, but that was that was crazy to see as well. Uh, the, yeah, the, the comfy Sableye team... Um, also did well. Uh, that that is. Uh, I mean, Sableye. I, I, I get it, right? We were talking. We were talking about it in 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 tub a little earlier. That you know, if you want to run screens, but you don't want to be, you don't want to, you want to be immune to fake out, and you want to be immune to taunt. You gotta you gotta give up like 500 BST. But yeah, you can run the base 320 BST mom that has screens. Um, so Sableye out here, Comfey. Uh, I was talking that guy up too. Maybe not very good. I tried it out. I didn't. I didn't think it was very good. But uh, I guess if you, it's a way to set up an islet. It's a cool mod. Um, so shout out to Chance for doing all well with that. Uh, who else? Where's the... Um, got Jared Hun making day two with uh, Walking Wake. Walking Wake's strongest soldier. Uh, there's an Excadrill in day two. No one oh, tells Donald. Oh, this is the other, this is the other Gapdos team. Yeah, that, that was my round one opponent. Or my, sorry, my round 10 opponent. Um, and it was a, it was a pretty harrowing set. Like, there, there was scary stuff going on. Uh, ended up getting there. Um, uh, really spooky. Uh, oh, that's actually what my calc is right with then. Okay. No, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I have, cool. I, I have one ready. Uh, the, the, there's a somewhere on this. Uh, the this paste is the calc is right, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for, also goggles, blood moon, very interesting choice, but fair enough. Uh, um, and then where's the uh, where's the guy? Where's the guy who used? Uh... <laughs> uh, oh, I want to give a shout out to to Tianchu, who's uh, one of my Austin locals. Who um, has, this, I think this is his first year seriously competing, but he made day two. I think his first time at a regional. So big shout out to him. Um, and then Stephen Hill uh, went eight and seven with. Uh, with Hisui and Zoroark. Uh, Rajan faced this round one of day two, um, and he said he clicked Tailwind Earthquake into it, and it just it didn't do anything in return. Um, so, uh, I mean, it, just, it, it is super cool to see this team making day two. I'm not too surprised that it didn't do too well in day two. I don't really believe in Hisui and Zoroark, but uh, it, it is very cool to see it go that far. And uh, the rest of the team, other than the Zoroark, I mean, Iron Crown, we just t talked about. That mod's really good. Registeel, I think, probably has a lot of potential. Um, you know, Torkoal, Torkoal with Fluttermane is definitely a, a cool combo, especially with uh, Trick Room Fluttermane. So uh, I, I think Zoroark might be cope. But the rest of the team does actually have uh, some really cool concepts on it. Um, I want to give a shout-out to Nathan Parker, specifically for his tournament run, um, where he went 7 out of 7-7. Seven, seven. That, that is tough. That is, uh, whew. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah, dropped round 14. Honestly, if I lost seven straight rounds, I'd probably drop two. Um, yeah. He, he, he's so. just out here. Uh, he, he's out here in the first quarter of a football game. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, like, giving up a touchdown is not ideal at Pokemon Regionals. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. And then, um, oh yeah, and then just for some teams that didn't make day two, but I did want to mention really quickly, uh, I wanted to uh, give a shout out to um, the Hydrapple that went 6-3, um, Kyle Loster. Uh, I actually, uh, I met Kyle at uh, one of the Chicago events over the holidays. And um, yeah, he started out 1-2, and I think, I think I talked to him, he started out 0-2, and I think I talked to him at that point. Um, I ran into him and I, and I was talking and he was like, yeah, I started out 0-2. I'm not really feeling very good. <laughs> and I, and I, I talked about his team and he, was, and he, yeah, he mentioned he was using Hydrapple. It had a lot of potential. And I was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> maybe that had this part of why he went 0-2. Um, but <laughs> shout outs to him. He ran it back. He went 6-3 and he got the points. So, yeah, I was um, going to say. 
I was gonna say. <laughs> and he said, he and I, actually, I ran into him. So. Yep, and I ran into him at the airport too. And he said, Hydrapple put into work. Um, people didn't respect it. And Paul, AV Pollen Pup is kind of cool. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to give it a shout out to Kyle because <laughs> I did not believe in Hydrapple, but he ran it all the way back. <laughs> Uh, I also played but, against the Hydrapple, and but yeah, um, I I learned how fickle beam worked when it uh, it, it got the the booster message uh, into my spiky shield. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, oh, I di- I dodged two attacks, and that turn was pretty good. But yeah, uh, Hydrapple's funny. Oh shit! Hey, there's Juwan. He went five four, and he got points with a. Uh... With uh, the little again. That's not dude. You turn dude's back. Amazing. He's still here. Let's go. Oh. <laughs> yeah. The all right. Any, any, I'll give you. I'll give you all a chance. Any any teams you wanted to shout out, or any players you wanted to shout out that, that got points. There was, a, yeah. I think, like a, a wheezing Reggie Kagas team. Oh or yeah. Like that. Oh, on, yeah. on Dozo. Yeah, it was something all wild right. like that. I, I the, they're embracing the two two two. Reggie Drago, that's not it. Just Reggie search Gigas. for Dondozo. Right. Yeah. Well, no, because there that, there's just multiple to Dozo, but yeah, there is a <laughs> there was a reason Reggie Gigas <laughs> choice. Oh, dude, I lost to this on ladder. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I de- choice card Reggie Gigas is scary, man. <laughs> oh god, this this is a scary team. <laughs> you don't realize how much Terra Normal yeah. Crush Grip does. <laughs> Until you face it. <laughs> it uh, yeah. It's just like a uh, hard press. It does 100 unless it doesn't. Mm-hmm. And then it will never call you. But if it does 100, it does 100. Yep, yep. This team, that team, definitely scary. Any other any other cool mods? Wait, is there a Yolu that got points? Oh, 5-4. Uh, yep. uh, but I guess super simply oh, coaching. Or they coach? Uh, uh, they coaching? Ente, Waterman. Tinglu? Uh, I guess they're coaching, coaching thing really well. Yeah, they're oh, doing that some of the too. Time. Yeah? Yo. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, oh, there's an iron leaves too. How did that superior do? I actually, I think the, uh, oh, how did the superior, so I saw the iron leaves. I think this person actually um, tweeted out their team. So there's, there's a rental code out there um, that I'm, too lazy to dig up but if you if you start digging you could probably find it somewhere on twitter yeah um, i saw it earlier today and then superior also went five four unfortunately it seems like a lot oh. of the cool teams ended up going five four getting points but hey i mean have you have you have the good res <laughs> um I mean, you probably need the chiyu to get the actual damage output you need on superior sadly um but cool to see cool to see a superior i did not that mon do not believe in that mon but this person's also a coward Air slash torn, um, and wide lens superior. Yeah. <laughs> wide lens superior is <laughs> Isn't Glare one hundred percent accurate? No. Yes. I'm pretty sure I yeah. got that buff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's maybe like they didn't want product. to miss their leaf storms. I, I, I have I mean, yeah, listened no, to Jamie Boyd. Okay. Missing a leaf storm is missing an attack and missing a nasty plot at the same time. It is. It does kind of make sense, but. Uh... Yeah, but the mon isn't good enough to like not have an item 90% of the time. That's that's kind of my thought on it too. Um Yeah, okay. Those look like all the cool mods that just that got points to me. Um are y'all ready to Oh, do there was a super trivia? Yeah. Yeah, this week like kind of good. Where's this where's this week kit? Is only one I, this I saw it. I think there was like two of them. Two. two. Yeah, there were two. There were two. Yeah. Uh, oh, five wrong. three and five four. Shout out to this guy with five, five three and Smart then Ross got points anyways. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, hmm. I'm wondering because I, I realized yeah you could just go five three drop and guarantee yourself top fifty six potentially if you're worried that well, losing would knock you out of it. Um, it's not really going to benefit you at all. Um, because you're queuing into a player, if you lose, then you're going to uh, have a 6-3 on your res, and that's just going to be a positive viewer resistance mm-hmm. unless the cutoff is like stupidly high. Um, that's true. Uh, I, I guess if the cutoff is looking to be at like 69% or something like that, then yeah, mm-hmm. having a 6-3 on your res would hurt. 
Uh, but that's really unlikely. Um, but yeah, I mean, if there's only like three or four, five and fours that get in there, yeah, you just and you're looking like you might be one of them. Then uh, it's plausible that you could uh, guarantee it. It's a more realistic play in day two. I remember Megan Rattle dropped at eight and four at UIC um, to secure a top before something, um, and that that's just a good play. Um, uh, but I mean, yeah, if you just want to like. Uh, do anything else uh, on your uh, Charlotte trip, then yeah, check out the city, uh, get dinner, and beat the rush. Yep. Did Darsh right. secure top 64? Was his like, no, 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 surely not. He didn't want any top seven, seven four is not going to make it. There were, there were enough people that had eight wins. No, he was seven three, um, right? Oh, okay. He was seven, yeah, three, seven three, but top it, you don't get any credit. Oh, dang. I mean, he wasn't the lowest placing player in day two, but that's because that didn't matter, right? It's still enough people who had eight wins. Yeah, he still had to get to nine wins to get into the top 64 convention. Yep. Um, he should have gone. All right. Y'all ready for some trivia? Some some, some usage stat yeah, trivia. Let's do it. All right. Give, name, the, so, name the three lowest win rate Pokemon that had at least 10 uses, which is about 1% usage. Ten uses in the tournament, or ten uses in ten. The... Ten uses in the um, tournament. Okay. Um, is this everybody guesses three, or everybody guesses one? Uh, you, you you can start guessing, and I'll tell you yes or no as you guess. Uh, okay. First guess: Metagross. Metagross think... is not uh, not one of them. I'm trying to find Metagross. Metagross mm-hmm. is uh, bottom ten, but not bottom five. Not bottom. Okay. Yeah. Metagross has Latios. A... Latios is actually right next to Metagross, um, but also, yeah, not quite wow. there. Metagross had a four point uh, forty three percent win rate, as did Latios. Okay, wow. Well, we're uh, what is the win percentage of the Pokemon? Oh, uh, so number three is um, hold up, where to go? Number number one is thirty six percent. Number two is thirty six or thirty six point seven percent, and number three is uh, where to go? Thirty nine percent. Okay, and so one of these Pokemon scraping. made day two, I believe. Okay, uh, yeah, we're really <laughs> scraping the bottom of the barrel. Here. Um, yeah, Galade. Um, no, not Galade. Um, Torkoal. Not Torkoal. Uh, Torkoal's good. Yeah. Uh, Whimsicott. Whimsicott is the second lowest. Yeah, sec- second of that. Yeah, thirty-six point seven percent usage. Fifty-five people brought us to the tournament. And uh, it actually got 44th, so I guess it uh, did get um, a day two finish. Um, but yeah, yeah no, on, was... on the Sun team. Walking Wake, yeah. Walking Wake. Walking, walking Wake is, yeah, of course, the the lowest win rate, consistently the lowest win rate Pokemon in <laughs> Limitless Tours. Walking Wake had 39 I can't believe and, we did again. I believe yeah. only one in day two. But yeah, Jared Hun is really the only, uh, the sun, Sun's strongest soldier, uh, the only player to make day two with both Walking Wake and, uh, and, and um, he was a cop. But okay, there's one the Pokemon had had exactly it's ten in... people use it just to cut off to, to to barely make a cutoff. And Nick, you're gonna love this one. Oh man, um, Murkrow? No. Okay. Gothitel. Um, not Dendozo. Gothitel or no? Um. Oh, Gastrodon. Well, you said exactly ten. It people is Gastrodon. Use it, yeah, exactly ten people got Gastrodon. Oh, Gastrodon <laughs> claiming its rightful, rightful place. Yep, thirty-six percent win rate. That mon not very good right now. Why Gastrodon? Uh, I'll when the you... most used water type has Grass Stab, not Gastro's format. <laughs> yeah, that's what yep. I'm saying. Like, why Gastrodon out of all of them? The highest placing but, Gastrodon like, player. Finished 412th out of 838. <laughs> That's top half right there. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, to give you man. numbers, to give you the rest of the bottom, uh, Ogre Pond Cornerstone had a 40% win rate. Uh, Landorus Therian had a 41% win rate. And then Sinistro, wow. and then Dragapult, and then Latios, and then Metagross were the, uh, the rest of the top 10, bottom 10. How Those? far below Lando T fell? Mm-hmm. Wow. Can't believe that. Um, 
Uh, you tell that to somebody from 2012. And... Yeah. You tell that to somebody from uh, Reg D, and they're going to be shocked. Um, <laughs> That's true too. But yeah, no, there were only four Lando T and um, Top 256, and uh, none made day two. That's shocking. That's... What do you guys uh, think is a reason for that? I mean, I can talk about my reasons, but yeah, it's Lando T's best terror was like flying right. And Raging Bolt and all that just kind of invalidated it. So. Yeah, sure. Um, like, you have to terrifying if you want the offensive pressure, but you also mm -hmm. don't get to. Uh, and so, um, yep. yeah, there were three Scarf Lando T, one Choice Man Lando T. But, um, oh, that was a Terra Poison uh, CB Lando T. Maybe, like... Terrible. Another Terra on it with AV could be good. Like U turn stomping, rock slide, or something. Just yeah, two or um, bulky, yeah. Fissure. <laughs> Okay. Could do that. I mean, Gavin used it. Well, he did use it, yeah. That's, um, true. that's surprising. I mean, I had Lando T on some of my prep for this uh, event. So I guess I touched a bullet there. Didn't make it too far. I did consider top. it, yeah. Um, Save. I did. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. All right. Next. Next. Uh, we're gonna do the the opposite. We're gonna say, uh, the top Pokemon with over one percent usage in terms of overall win rate. Uh, and nails. I'm sorry to tell you, Screamtail only had eight uses, so it just barely misses that cutoff. But it would have been would have been number two uh, if it did hit. Okay. What sure. about a CNR? Can I? He sweet and Arcanine is actually number two in win rate at a fifty five point nine percent win rate with thirty five people bringing it. Let's go! Oh damn, there's a lot okay. of people that brought it. Uh, good job, Doggo. Um, best intimidate fire type in the format? Question mark. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> like. Um. Fire ogre pond. Fire yeah, Ogre Pond is is not is not it. It is it is pretty high. It has a fifty four percent win rate. Um, but yeah, not not quite up there. Not quite uh, high enough. Uh, what's the win rate we're looking for? Uh, we are looking for uh, number one is fifty seven point seven. Number two is Heesween Arcanine at fifty five point nine. Number three is fifty five point eight. Number four is fifty five point six. And then, okay, so okay. we are looking, we're, 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 split, we're splitting hairs here. It's about 55%. Um, uh, so, and you said the usage is like 1%? Usage is above 1%. Is that what you said? Uh, and and Glamora uh, is correct. 57.8% win rate uh, is Glamora. So Glamora had the highest overall win rate in the tournament of any Pokemon that had more than two uses. Uh, fun fact, the Pokemon that had the highest win rate with exactly two uses was Articuno. Uh, which had Dawn. At when who went eleven four, and then someone else who went three and three. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the CNR can I use the fake rocks rock type. Glumor is still king. Um, it oh, what was Smeargle's one right? Smeargle. Oh, that's a, that sounds oh, like actually a had a. It had it had uh, eleven uses and had a fifty four point five percent win rate, um, but <laughs> it does not quite crack into the top three. Uh, it is. I am top. Yeah, go ahead. It is top, it's number six. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, just there were a couple of smear goals that did really well, and so surprised that didn't care. I mean, it did, but just not. Okay. Uh, what else? Mm -hmm. To give you some context, uh, smear goal had about the same win rate as the mon that always goes 6 3 for most players, uh, Dendozo Tatsugiri. <laughs> also went 54% win rate. Oh, that's so funny that Dendozo was still 54% percent win rate by just not converting it all on the day two that's hi alex that's just hilarious oh wow Yo, i was one one was yeah, um, just time for us to yeah i'm hopping in here just to make sure just hopping in here to make sure that the guests are not being Yeah, yeah. Sorry, oh, just if you if you all are trying, if you don't if you don't want if if you, if you need to go or if you if you want to cut it off, I can cut it off. I'm sorry. I know I know it's a little longer than normal. 
I'm back. I'm back. And yeah, I wanted to make sure that no one's being held hostage against their will. We're at the two and a half hour mark. What what is going on here? I I just see like tub takes is still going. And I'm like, okay, they're not even at Kalka's, right? Like they're still just talking about smear goals, win percentage. And I'm like, bro, Adi is literally got these guys (laughs) aged up. Yeah, Adi, Adi can't keep us on track. Uh, Kalka's right. We're doing trivia instead. Trivia's fun. I haven't thought of trivia. <laughs> no, everyone said they didn't have a calc ready. So, um, I have one ready. But dude, Burns was the one that took me out. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. So um, wait, where, where's Vern? Where is Vern? That's true. All right, y'all have your fun. I'm gonna go back to putting together this uh, shower thing. Okay. Uh, um, okay. Just I'll give you. Was, do, oh, we still haven't guessed the uh, the last number three. The number three is gouging fire, at fifty five point eight percent, and number four was Ursula Blood Moon, um, just behind that. But yeah, gouging fire had a really good tournament oh. overall. All right, oh. and then I have one more piece of trivia for you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say like uh, a week before a week or. T- Week before, uh, Massachusetts locals were just full of gouging fire. So I guess they really kn- knew what the what the call was for this regional. It was mm-hmm. it was just weird. Everybody was running gouging fire. Um, okay. One last question, and I'm gonna I, I have the, I have all the top teams here. Uh, what was the most common core of six Pokemon brought to the tournament? If you can name a player who used it. That also work, and because I have the I have the, the standings up here, uh, did even, get even me, at least know. one finish in top thirty two. No, that is number three. That is the most common day two, what? but it's not the most common overall. Uh, was it what? Jody? It was Jody's team. Yes, Jody used the most boring team in the tournament. Two percent of the field, two point one percent of the field used exactly these six Pokemon. It did win Victory Road the previous week. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. Can anyone guess number two? I didn't use this the one's most a little harder. <laughs> Um, is it the Hoish team, or is that the, still the same stuff? It is not. The, that is not that team. Was it a size man? Okay. It is not a size. Uh, oh yeah. Size size. Oh wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow, that's a surprise. Hey. I'll, I'll give you a clue. And you said it's the second the, most used. It's the second most used team overall. The highest placer with it uh, finished top two fifty six. Oh, oh wow! No. What? Oh no! Yep. Oh, wow. <laughs> that, that's gonna be a hard one. Was it uh, two 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 Dondozo? Uh, I it, it was Dondozo. I don't know if it's exactly two 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 Dondozo, but uh, you can see it is the Chapa Dozo team had a one point eight nine percent usage, and the highest placing uh person who used that team went six three and finished top two fifty six. Didn't even have the res to make it to uh top one twenty eight. So, oh wow! Yeah, that, is that team was not the call. <laughs> yeah, every everyone practiced against that team. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah so, that's. Awesome. What was the highest placing Alex team? Actually, that's a good question. I I am curious about that now that now that you've nerd sent me with that. Um, let's go raging bolts. Uh, what else did we have? We had an ogre pond. We had a flutter main. We had a chen pao. Mm-hmm. We had a dragonite. Only one. There's and only ten. one in top two fifty six. That's crazy. Wow. So yeah. So I, 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 I did say this. I the the meta game changed so much between between Portland and Charlotte, uh, and, it, and it felt it, I, it felt I, very very difficult to keep up with. I, I heard someone say that it matched up really well into the Portland meta game. This was not the Portland meta game. <laughs> <laughs> that person. I wonder how much this coming back when they said, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> all right. Like Alex so so rudely interrupted us to mention, we've gone about half an hour over what we normally do, and I apologize for that. Um, but thank you all for for coming by, and uh, thank you to to my three lovely guests for um for for sticking around for all this time. I hope I hope this wasn't um <laughs> I hope this didn't go too long. Uh, but yeah, if you if you missed out on um on any part of this, you can go check it out on YouTube. It'll be up tomorrow. Um, and I'm going to that i'm going to send you off to someone else but yeah any uh any final words for any from you they all have any shout outs you want to give anything like that so i just wanted to say don't we have liverpool regionals happening this weekend yeah we, we do, do have, have liverpool. Liverpool. Oh, yeah. we forgot to talk about that though 
Uh, uh, it wasn't in the dock. Alex <laughs> Alex put the dock together, and I did not second. <laughs> I just we, we can smart money real quick. I uh, can yeah, get about. Uh, all right, um, Eric. Uh, okay. I, I pick Eric. Uh, Jumanji for me. Uh, uh, I'll take uh, Raxon. Torview. All right, cool. That's our that's our preview for Liverpool Regionals. Look out for those four incredible <laughs> players. <laughs> Um, and yeah, uh, we're going to send you off to Jody, who, you know, we didn't get to talk about his team other than telling you that it was the most boring team at the tournament, but, um, but he could tell you all about it. Um, he's streaming right now. And I think he actually is doing a recap of his, uh, his tournament run. So go say hi to him. Let him know you came from, um, give him a follow and whatnot. Yeah. Until next time, we will see you all later. See you. Bye. Bye. Peace.